Welcome back to the Aviation RC Noob Podcast. Thank you for joining us for our Halloween special, Fly Wing. On a brisk autumn evening, much like the ones that we see nowadays, at my RC flying field, it was an evening mist that began to roll in, and the planes became silhouettes. There were a handful of old timers at our field, and they always warned us, never send out your planes. Don't send it anymore. It's too dangerous. They always had this edge of fear in their tone. One of them said, if it goes down, let it go. And I looked over with a dubious look. They had looked back and said, we're dead serious. If the evening mist is out and you lose your plane out there, just come back tomorrow. Or you may never come back. And they point to the field of crops. Don't follow the battery to With that, they finish packing and they leave. Now, at this point, I'm feeling kind of uneasy. But I ended up deciding to pack it away that night myself. But a week later, one evening, I was out there with a long standing cover. He'd been flying since he was able to hold the controller. And I asked him, I said, hey, you know, What's the deal with those old timers? Why are they so spooked? And something about never coming back. You know, some man eating mist or something. Of course I'm mimicking their tone. And he laughs as he replies, he says, I, I didn't believe in it myself. They kept swearing up and down the story's true. And their story checks out, I suppose. I mean, there was a member, John Billings, who went missing 15 years ago. The old guys claimed that it was after he went out going into the crops on a misty night just like this one that we're kind of sitting here near. And I looked it up and according to the missing persons report, it checks out. I mean, I, I don't usually worry about that kind of stuff and it's likely a coincidence. Besides, if you throw a plane in the misty dusk, it's on you. And I kind of had to agree. As I looked out over the field, he leaned in and said, there's something out there, though. something leaving. Just enough to keep you going deeper in. Watch out, or it'll claim another victim. <laughs> and he finished, packed up, and they left. Now, I had one last plane ready, and I thought that it wasn't the, really the best time being near dusk and everything was going to turn a silhouette probably midway through the battery. And I did notice a mist clinging to the crops out there in the field. But I still wanted to fly that last pack, always one last one. So um, as I launched it into the air, what I hadn't started to notice was that the ground mist got even thicker and thicker. And the dusk made the orientation hard like I predicted. And then as I was trying to bring it around, I. I, after a while, realized that it wasn't coming towards me, but it was going further out. And after a while, before I realized that the plane was way out there, I mean, it's like a 40-acre field, it was way on the backside. And the battery alarm started to beep. And I know, uh-oh, that means it's gonna start losing power. Sure enough, it started to fade, and the power just wasn't quite enough to keep it, to get it back up into the air, and glide it down all the way into the crops, way out there. And of course, I cursed myself. And, you know, I confirmed my mark on the tree way out there. And we head out that direction of the thing we do. I was walking out there for like nearly 10 minutes to the back of the field. In I hide tobacco, following the beep. 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 And as I got closer, it got a little louder as I felt like I was honing in. It was getting close, I could tell. And then the crops uh, abruptly gave way to this small little pot. About five feet, five feet out from the edge of the murky water, I could see there's a plane in there, mostly submerged. And I could hear, just in the water, this muffled beep. Now, it was hard to see because of the mist, that if it was mine or not, but I mean, I'm the only one out here. And it was sinking, so, I started to reach out. I could almost reach it. It was like at the tip of my fingertips. I actually touched it at one point. 
and of course it <laughs> couldn't grab it, so it pushed it a little bit further. And I could see that it just kept getting a little bit deeper. I had to, this is really my last chance. And I pushed it out a little bit further, one last time. I go, oh, you know, maybe, maybe if I put a foot, a foot near the edge, maybe kind of half hanging out. And I realized if I went any further, I might fall in. And I said, ah, what's the chances of that? I reached out one last reach. Just before I started to lose my balance, I heard, hey, is this your plane? I straightened up. I looked around, I saw the shape of a guy who just left me holding the plane. And uh, he was about 150 feet behind me, and he was holding up something that looked like the plane I was flying. I had mostly a silhouette in the mist. Well, possibly, I replied. And I was somewhat confused. I, I mean, I thought, my plane was right there. And, and I pointed at the lake. I said, you know, I, I think it's over here. And I looked back to that waterlogged plane. Sure enough, it must have sunk. So I couldn't see anything in the water. And the beeping from the pond was gone. But I could hear it clear as day behind me, uh, near my friend who had picked up my plane. I could not imagine how I didn't hear that earlier. Well, he told me that he'd seen my plane go down and drove back uh, on the back road to try and go and help find it. I told him about my experience. We went back, you know, as I, after I met up with them and grabbed my plane, confirmed everything's good, disconnected the battery. And I said, you gotta see this pond. He looked at me like, what pond? And we trekked back, only to find that there was like a large gray mud patch where that pond was. I still wonder what I saw, what, what was out there that night. Is that me? I'll tell you what, though, I never flew at dusk again, especially after that missed it a little bit. Honestly, I could have been a goner, just like John's Billingsley. <laughs> Stay safe out there. Ooh, that was a good one. Thanks for telling that story, Matthew. And helping to set the mood for this episode, which is all about the frights and scares that can happen in this hobby. Um, we've uh, got a few stories to share, and we put the call out for uh, you guys to write in or call in or send us some audio uh, telling your scary story. So we did have a few of you do that. Thank you. We'll be sharing those in a little while. But before we get into all that and the flying stories that Matthew and I have, I want to take a second and thank you guys for hanging with us every episode. Um, chances are, if you guys are enjoying the podcast, then you've got a friend or two who would enjoy it as well. And if you would, reach out to them, share the podcast with them, let them know about us, and that'll give you guys something to enjoy together uh, every other week when we release episodes. That's so yeah, idea. uh, Matthew, ready to get into some flying stories? Oh man, am I? <laughs> well, let's start off with you. What did you do? Okay, um, well, I think I mentioned last time that I'd put together a spur of the moment uh, design build challenge, and on the flight test forums, and I put together a COVID nineteen plane. I've now so far I've got three different iterations, none of which fully work. So, um. I'm trying a couple of variations. I've had a long, slow gliding descent um, with a powered plane. Uh, that's a or a completely uncontrolled mess. Uh, so so far, not quite like I want. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm focusing on using smaller motor systems like the FT Easy or the Power Up plane systems, um, mostly so that way if if for something something happens and it hits somebody in the head, it really won't make a difference at all because they're so lightweight. If anything, right. it just destroys the plane, which is really all I ever want. Um, I think I might end up making like a full size nut ball, uh, tomorrow if I have to, and then slapping, you know, a COVID-19, uh, printout on the bottom and on the top and I'm kind of using that. So if I have to, that's what I'll do. Um, I also finished 
Uh, I've been working kind of on the side to put together the MH-14, which is also known as the Flying Flea or the Flying Coffin because it got a bad rap uh, early on. Um, as a French plane where you basically for $300 and a handful of items at the store, uh, at your local um, big box store, except back then there was no big box store, your local hardware store, you could build yourself a plane. And it was tiny, probably the size, uh, about the size of a dinner table, uh, like a, a long dining room table. And you could fold it up and put it on the back and tow it to the field with your car. And then the wings fold out, and it's ready to go, and off you go. You um, towed it to the field? Well, I mean, you put it on a little trailer, and it, it was maybe eight feet wide when the wings tipped in. I think okay. it was like a total of a 16 or 30-foot 30, 30 wingspan, something like that. It was, it was really very small, um, and it was very compact. So uh, I've been wanting to kind of build this. of small or different. Uh, well, I mean, ultralights tend to be around 20 foot wingspans. Oh, this was, this was a plane like you'd a actually plane. climb in and fly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, oh. and so I designed, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no. So I was working on making an RC version. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So I wanted to go over what the real plane is. It's already a tiny thing. And so I'm making this kind of a 1806, 2300 KB motor with like a 400 or 450 milliamp three cell battery or two cell battery nothing crazy um i think the uh, wingspan is somewhere around 18 inches yeah that's about uh, 20 inches um and the interesting thing about the design is that the main i'll call it the main flying wing is what adjusts up or down that's your elevator and what it does is it directs flow more or less flow over the rear wing which is it's almost like a staggered by wing where right. the bottom wing starts at the back of the top wing. Um, so one is uh, sitting on the top of the fuselage and behind you, kind of at your back. And the other one is overhead up top, um, directly above your, your head. And that that's what pivots. And so as it directs air, more air over the rear wing, um, it creates more lift and thereby creating a downward force or less um, creating an upward force. And so basically you end up having, it's a different aerodynamic design. It's pretty neat. And then otherwise it has just a rudder. So it has this, and it was a directly coupled to the steering um, yoke. And so what happened is when you felt lift, it would lift the main wing. You could feel that in the stick. So you had a very different, more connected experience. And that's what a lot of people really liked about it. Um, it had, a, the early design had a fatal flaw that um, it would go into a dive and it may not pull out um, because of the way their dynamics ended up working out. So uh, they came up with a fix and that's what people, there's actually some that are built today and then people still fly them and they fly them very successfully and seem to love them. So, uh, yes. so I've been building that. I've got the top wing to put on and some wheels. And I'll have to give that a go. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm doing an experiment taking like a, a paper craft plane. Some of those are done really, really well. So I blew that up to be about like two or three hundred percent, which will still end up creating a pretty small plane. I think I'll have to use a thirty millimeter EDF or maybe a fifty-five millimeter EDF uh, to get it flying. And so I'm in the beginning of that. So like it's an A thirty-seven. Uh, it's a jet. Um, so I'll see what happens with that. Now, when um, you say a paper craft plane, and forgive my ignorance on this, are you <laughs> is this sort sort of like a origami build for a plane? So there's a whole sector of a hobby where basically people take cardstock and make pep paper replicas of planes, and okay. they will make them so that they function. Like you you could if you balance it, you should be able to toss it and have it glide across your room. Um, and so this one's not a whole lot different. And they're really pretty realistic. Um, and for a foam board design, that comes together pretty well. As long as you're using the the correct aerodynamic principles, making sure that your airfoil is an airfoil. Um, so I don't see any reason why you can't get it to work. And I know other people have done something similar. Um, so I'm just giving it a go with this and seeing how it works out. So I'll be reporting it on it as I develop it. Um, 
the skin that they this guy put together is awesome. He has like it's uh I'm trying to think of what the Stallhart, I think is the guy. Um anyway. Uh when I get a little bit closer I might I might mention a little bit more about it. And then the other thing I was trying to get our the old fogey, the old the old reliable up in the air, uh, so that my son my both of my sons could fly it. Um and I've just been having a little bit of a trouble getting that. I think some of it has to do with a uh, those the push rods have a really long lead, and they yeah, really they do. don't have any any mid support on the one I I have. So uh, I, I think they've been kind of I'll call it sloppy in in some of the controls. And so I don't know. It it flies really well when it flies really well. I ended up getting it up the other day, and I, but I had to have a constant uh, right and up trim to keep it flying. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided that really wasn't the best thing to buddy box with. So I've been on the hunt to do the hands off thing. So once I get that back to the spot where I can take the hands off the controls at mid throttle and just let it fly, uh, then I'll then we'll be doing buddy box. So shouldn't be a big deal. It's uh, we just happen to happen to you know crack a cheap 10 inch propeller so I had to go back home and put some stuff on so it's just a way of it um i think that's that's oh and i got a little bit of time with uh i have a tiny hawk uh quadcopter so i got a little bit of time um to just kind of tool around with that in the yard nothing too much but it was it was a different it was a fun to have a little bit of a different experience and get some experience on the quadcopter now is that the same quad that you had when um, when you would fly quads when I was up there, or because you had that little uh, that little yeah, white one? Yeah, no, I think this it one's was. a little bit bigger and it can handle. It's about the same size. The one I had was a Beta FPV sixty five, I think, and this one's the the Tiny Hawk two, I think, um, and again it it's about the same. Uh, I think it can handle wind a little bit better. Is all okay. Um, it's one of those ones where it's sort of a cross between an indoor and an outdoor, but I figured I could on a light breeze day take it around the backyard and get a little bit of practice with it. So, so I, I got a chance to fly all those and you know get a little bit of my need to fly out, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, my field is having a warbird fly in in a little bit, uh, not this coming weekend because that's Halloween, but. Or the weekend that we're releasing this, but the weekend after. So I'm debating about pulling. We have the Spitfires. I have the, the Spitfires in the other room. Um, but I was thinking about maybe that's the opportunity to build a Master Series something. Uh, Corsair, Spitfire, or uh, P-38. And I really want to be, build a P-38, honestly. So that might be my excuse. What about you? What would you fly, Joe? Um, let's see. So, um, we, we had the build night, which, uh, yeah, I was working on building the old fogey for that. Um, so that's, that's mostly built. I've got a little more work to do on it, which we can talk about. Well, I'll go ahead and talk about mm -hmm. it now. Um, I was going to build the sure. old fogey as the sort of the Halloween plane. I was going to, um, yeah. Uh, cut the so I was going to cut the wings out, but not glue them up and get you know not glue the under cambered uh, mm -hmm. style of them yet, and then not glue the wingtips on while they were still flat. I wanted to trace in like uh, the bat wing kind of effect. Yeah. And then <clears throat> during the build party, I just got going and just head first into the build and glued it right up. So. The wings are glued, and I forgot to cut it out. So I don't know if I'm going to go back and <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to go back and cut all that out. Uh, try to after well, the fact cut those wings to shape, or if if I'm just going to mount them up and say I've got an old fogey again. Um, uh, it, you know, really, you can't go too terribly wrong. Here, here's something you could do: you could get another couple of pieces of foam and and trace out the other wing, and cut out the bat wing and build that. But in the meantime, get it, you know, get it figured out so that the controls are working the way they're supposed to, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with the original wing and then see what the bat wing, you know, does when you, you know, when you get it finished. I might. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, you were trucking on that build though. I was quite impressed. 
Yeah, it it came along pretty good. Uh, it helped that I didn't have to cut all the uh, the plan parts out, and by that I mean mm-hmm. I've mentioned before that you uh, sent down the the big full size printer plot or plot printer. Right. Yeah, the full size uh, printout of the plan, so I didn't have to like tape pieces of paper together. I was, you know, in the original mm-hmm. first time I built the fogey, I was able to cut those parts out uh, yeah. out of the paper and then glue uh, tape the paper to the to the foam board and then cut the parts mm-hmm. out. So yeah, it's I quite had a process. The... It's like a a three, like cut it out once, tape it together, cut it out, trace it, cut it out again. <laughs> so it's almost mm-hmm. like you've done the same shape three different times. By the time you get to to done and it's like oh i think i, I yeah. think i'm done with the plane now <laughs> um but i had the foresight at the time to instead of throw that paper away uh mm-hmm. kind of fold them within the few basically within the fuselage i fold the fuselage in half and had all the other parts tucked in it so mm-hmm. now that i'm going back and rebuilding the fogey i had that little packet of all the fogey parts i could just open back up tape those nice. to the uh to the foam board and like because i didn't cut through the score marks i just kind of did little perforations i was right. able to just recut all those parts out real quick so all the parts except the power pod and the servo tray are cut uh right. the fuselage is glued together and then um the wings are partly glued i just gotta like they've got the under camera i gotta glue the wing tips on <clears throat> okay you gotta kind of bend the the polyhedral yeah, and nice. I actually still had the cutouts for the various gauges. Uh, the gauges were still uh, nice. the papers for the gauges were still in yeah, there. Yeah, so actually, get the angle the same. Right, I think I still. I'd have to double check, but I think I still had the uh, the foam pieces that I cut as the angle guides. So I had the the dihedral uh, what, the dihedral gauge, and I had the uh, camber gauge all still cut out and in that little packet so that's part of the reason that went so quick um nice and then the saturday so last saturday i (coughs) which just which for us was just a couple days ago um i went out (laughs) and and flew the vulture and i was really excited and my wife was going with me which is uh very unusual um but she said, "Yeah, I'll go with you today." So we went out, uh, mm-hmm. put the put the plane in the back of the car, and uh, had the batteries topped off, and got out nice. there. Was putting the wing on and putting, you know, hooking the battery up, and got it all paired up, and got my transmitter moved over to the Vulture profile, and went to check the surfaces. And yeah, they're looking good. And the, this is one of the advantages of doing oh, like the hundred pl- pre flights while the plane's still in the back of the car because I'm constantly checking stuff. And I was like, man, why is that... Why is my elevator not seeming to work all of a sudden? Um, oh. And it would go one way, but it wouldn't go the other, but I heard the servo still going, and I went back... You know, I kind of flipped it around and checked. And the control horn had come unglued. And I was like, oh, that sucks. And I look, and there's the rudder. Its control horn had come unglued. Oh, um, so that with the heat loosened up the glue? Yeah, I'm thinking that either the heat in the garage or the heat in the back of the car maybe softened that glue up enough that it pulled out, or I didn't get a good enough glue on it the first time. Um, it, so, um, a daytime heat, if you're leaving it in the car, and you know, uh, unless you were doing like we were when we were together running the AC, um, it it is hot enough to just loosen the glue enough where if there's a continuous pressure over hours it'll it'll come out mm-hmm. and i don't know that because basically we i got in the car cleaned out the back seat laid down i put the plane in there i had to grab a couple things so the plane really wasn't in the back of the car all that long except for then okay. the drive out which had the ac going yeah that but it's been it then it's in the back of the car, and I've got it's a Prius, so there's that back window for the hutch that maybe had it. Be, I don't know. Anyway, you mean it came greenhouse. unglued. It had the greenhouse. <laughs> yeah, so it came I'm unglued. Good. I had to run home yeah. um, and sit there apologizing to my wife like crazy. It's like, you know, we took you. You came with me. We made the drive out here. I couldn't even fly the thing, uh, but we went home. I fired up the glue gun. I got the control horns glued back in, and okay. then. I said, I'm going to go back out. And she said, well, I'll go with you. So we went out again. 
and got to flying. Uh, it went up that time because all the control horns stayed in, and um, <laughs> still still having to strap the battery to the front to uh, get the CG right. But I I sent it up, flew it around for a little while. Um, even though it was calm down at the ground, there must have been some wind up above the tree lines because I was having mm. a real hard time getting her to fly. Uh, decently at lower altitude once I got her kind of up above the trees and I knew there was a cross breeze because I could tell the way she was slipping sideways through the air yeah, relative to yeah. the direction she was pointed but once I got up in the clean air she started flying better um, and so yeah. I'm guessing it, it had to have been ground turbulence that was causing it to just like suck the plane down um, I don't know but Got some good flight time there. Brought it in for a landing to uh, check the surfaces and see if there was anything mm -hmm. I do to get her flying a little smoother at lower altitude. And right. I don't have any landing gear, so I did a belly land on the grass, and it ripped the paper off the foam uh, where the <sighs> Velcro was stuck to the bottom of the power pod. As so yeah. I was, oh man, I was gonna. Oh well, I guess we'll have to pack it up and go home. And mm -hmm. Rachel, my wife, said, "Well." You know, if you can figure out a way to get back up in the air, like we hadn't been out here all that long, figure it out. I, okay, <laughs> so um, I'll tell you managed what, to the best. <laughs> it, she is, and so I managed to run some rubber bands back and forth from the uh, the barbecue skewers that go through the power pods, just kind of loop it back mm -hmm. and forth across the underside of the plane to hold the battery up in position, um, right. and then. I was about to launch it in about to launch it again and I asked her, I said, Look, I'm gonna put it up there, but you know, if you want to if you want to put your hands on the sticks for a while and try flying it, not expecting her to say yes. Um, but she said, Yeah, I'll try flying it once. Which floored me. Um Right? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I we, know uh, that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so we wait, uh, wait, you you wanna do this? Oh hold on, hold on. <laughs> Well, I think I think what it was not so much a wanting to as much as humoring me and making me feel good, which it did. Um, yeah, right. So I put it up in the air, got it, got it up high enough, got it trimmed out again, uh, got it flying fairly decently, and then unclipped the transmitter from her, uh, the lanyard around my neck and handed her the yeah. transmitter and said, "Don't worry about this stick pointing to the throttle." I said, "Just worry about this right hand stick for the rudder and right. the." elevator and i did make sure with her <clears throat> not to make the same mistake i made with my father-in-law which was to tell her Give the this basic is, primer this is what the sticks do <laughs> and uh and it was a good thing because she has no yeah. experience with them so i said you yeah. know if you if you pull if you know if you pull the right stick back she says it's going to go down i said no <laughs> it's going to go up yeah, right. so I got I those take care people, of. But... Think of it as a as a flying stick yoke. If you pull it towards you or down, it it pulls the plane up. If you pull it towards you, the plane's going to go up. If you push it down, that brings the nose down. Think of it like that, as if you had it flat, and this this is your control yoke. And then a lot of people go, oh, oh, okay then, because mm -hmm. otherwise it doesn't make any. Generally, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> nice. So congratulations on learning from past experiences. I know you're yeah. well ahead of the game from me, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it up in the air, handed it off, let her fly it around. I said, you know, just kind of bring it into big loops. And I had already kind of said, you know, it doesn't take much mm -hmm. and this is what I'm doing. So I kind of walked her through a little bit. And, but got her flying okay. and I specifically nice. did not want her worrying about the throttle channel. So I had it set to be fairly level flight. And I knew as she yep. turns, like anytime you turn, you're losing you're lift, lose so you're going bit. to descend yeah. a bit. Um, and I didn't catch it before she got low enough to then get into the ground noise. Um, oh, okay. They, yeah, she probably got, you know, two minutes of flight time before the before it got into the ground noise. <laughs> and that's when that's it started. two minutes. It's a minute and a half more than I ever had in my first couple of flights. <laughs> yeah. And uh but it's just started Great. pulling the plane down. She started losing lift and it was she ended up getting into this big spiral on the way down. Okay. And you know, at that point it was going through my mind again of like, man, I wish I had a buddy box. 
Um, know, but right? I didn't want to just take the controller from her. <laughs> and so, yeah, I was trying to, you know, level out, get fly this way. Yeah. yeah. That, and she was heading right for a tree in the middle of that loop. <laughs> and I knew she was going to either hit the tree and possibly hang it up in the tree or it was going to fall or it was going to miss the tree. Right. And it was, you know, a couple seconds later, it was going to hit the ground. So right before it hit the tree, uh, I was on the throttle side of her. I, right before I hit the tree, I reached over and flipped the throttle kill switch just to protect right. the motor and the power pod. Yep. And yeah, you're less, far less likely to damage uh, any of the electronics or, uh, or the propeller for that matter. Mm-hmm. So if, if you manage to recover the plane, you might still be able to put it back up in the air and, and enjoy some more time with it. And it was almost capable of going back in the air. Uh, surprisingly, did not break the prop. It did stress the prop, though. I can look at the base of the okay. propeller blade, and I see a little white where the yep. uh, plastic's been stressed. Yeah, you uh, just bend that back. It goes away. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to me, Joe. I'm Don't not risking listen. it. Um, yeah, right. But it it could have gone back in the air, but when it... I, I think it hit the wing on the tree, or it may have just nose first. It was hard to tell at the distance. Uh, but it ended up shoving the power pod back into the plane. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah it, so you... Did you have any of the reinforcements? Uh, those little um, washers or whatever? I think I had I, them on the outside of the plane, okay, but, not but not on, on the, the power end, pod themselves. But not on the power pod. And the power pod is yeah. where the barbecue skewers just split it. Yeah. Like, it just yeah, yeah. ripped it. Um, <laughs> so it, it was All done. done. Yeah, and the whole time that we were walking out to get the plane, once I picked it up, brought it back, and kind of went through the post-flight debrief of explaining, you know, mm. what the damage was and what happened, and you know, it was, look, I've had far worse, and yeah, this, this isn't is, a big uh, deal. It's not uh, a this problem. This is one of those landings you can walk away from, so don't worry about mm -hmm. it. <laughs> and I said, you know, I want, and this is the point where she is most definitely humoring me and putting up with me, but I wanted to make sure that she knew. I walked her through the damage. Was, Look, the motor's fine. Prop stress, we had to replace it, but I got a bunch of those. They're not expensive. And, mm -hmm. like, the power pod stripped out. I had to rebuild that, but that's easy enough. You know, and you see the wing, like, flipped at a 45-degree angle. That's because one of the rubber bands on the wing came off, and I run them diagonal across the top, right. so it twisted the right. wing. The wing's not damaged, and the whole time, it's, just, it's okay. I'm not upset. It happens. You, right. you know, it was an easy crash. She said, Joe, you're going on enough. I want to think that you're actually upset about it. And I said, okay, well, I'll shut up because I'm not. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, good. Uh, it, you yeah. know, that's one of the things I like about Rachel is, you know, uh, she can be blunt. Um, I know that's not for everybody, but she um, she's okay with being blunt when it comes to like, hey, we we don't. It's we just gonna stop it. We're good. Mm -hmm. And you go, oh, okay, then. Yeah, it, <laughs> and we're she good, needs Joe. it too. She's not, she's not one of those people who kind of like is saying it just to make you feel better for now. But she's really like not mm -hmm. okay with what just happened. Like, no, she genuinely means what she's saying. We can stop yep. it now. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so then on the on the drive back, um, we were talking a little bit, and there was just this this heavy silence uh, for a little bit. And I, like I said, look, I want you to know that you said yes to fly this time. I promise that I am not going to take that as a green light to ask you to go flying every time, to ask you to go hang with me every time, or every time you do go flying to fly. I'm not going to try to push the transmitter into your hand. Like, I'm not taking this as a green light. And she kind of let loose a sigh of relief of, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a very smart man, sir. A very smart man. <laughs> So, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so work. basically, the vulture and the old fogies. What I've had going on. Um, nice. That's uh, really? that's it there. Do you... <laughs> that sounds like fun, though. It sounds like you had a good time. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, we had a build party last Friday night. You want to talk about that? Build party. Whoop whoop. Yeah. Um. Yeah. We advertised that uh, October. Um. I can't remember what it was at the. I think we were trying for mid-month, and then, as usual, something kind of gets in the way, and we kind of shifted it so, uh, to be a night that worked a little bit better for both of us so we could enjoy some time with everybody. 
Um, and we had a bunch of people kind of come out and join us while they were building what they were building. We had uh, some people just kind of checking out what it was about. Um, we had one guy from Australia, uh, Kevman Tim. He was going over his how he built certain pieces of, of his builds. He's got some... Um, He's got a very interesting, robust way to handle some of the more tricky parts of having a wing that you want to remove and yet still maintaining like a strong fuselage that isn't going to crumple at the first time it hits the ground, you know? Right. Um, he, it, it was it was neat. And we were, you know, doing what we do in build nights, which is where each of us were building something different. We were sharing our ideas about different motors um about what we liked or disliked about different builds or different planes um you know kind of shared the hey did you see this crazy plane and then followed it up with how did you do that well could you show me a little bit more about that and then we get little close-ups and things like that and just talk and chop really it was good it was a lot of fun and i actually took attendance this time oh um, whoop, whoop. Good for so, you. I'm so glad you did because I, <laughs> I I probably miss half the people. It, yeah, because pe- people were in and out throughout the night. It, it was a it was a solid turnout. Like I think we had six or seven of us throughout. You know, I, the I majority it, of at it. At one point, at one point or another, yeah, there were seven other people other than us. And I think throughout the night, I think we had about eleven people kind of come and go. Yeah, it you know, including us. They're, they're, my count shows 11, so quick shout out okay. to those who did uh, come out and join us. Battle Axe, which is Chris, uh, Cabman, Tim, that you were talking about, uh, mm-hmm. showing off some of his build techniques. We had yeah. Griffler, uh, T106, who's, uh, I think his name is Troy. We had mm-hmm. uh, The Hanger, which is Sam. Yeah. Not to be confused with the yeah. other Hanger, Hanger RC, Sam, who, who was also the out Sam there. Platt. Yeah. Yep, Sam Platt. So we had the Hangar and the Hangar RC. We had uh, uh, Zediok, which is Jess um, Spawns, mm-hmm. who that was the first time I'd had a chance to meet and talk mm-hmm. to him. Um, yeah, he's all... uh, Dan Spawn, Spawns Holes. He's the guy, uh, a lot of people know him um, because he's the one who helped, I guess, flight test pull together most of their plans. And so he's got kind of a little icon on all the plans. Oh, um, nice. So they're like, oh, I know that guy because they've, they've seen his logo on the plan sets. Okay. He's done a lot um, to help us all get in the air, I think. Right. And we had, let's see, we, where was I? Oliver. Uh, mm-hmm. We had Ron came out and then Thomas. Yep. So, yep. including you and me, that brought us to 11. Mm-hmm. So, 11, thanks, guys, awesome. for coming out. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. And, and really, honestly, I kept in there for a while. I was. Uh, just kind of talking to Troy a bunch. We had a bunch of questions and ideas that were kind of thrown back and forth. And, it, it, you know, on top of what we were all talking about throughout the whole night. So uh, it was a good time. So um, with that, uh, let's go on and announce uh, when we're going to do that again. Um, and the, this time it's going to be the Hangar RC Build Night. So um, that Build Night is sponsored by the Hangar RC. We ask everybody to kind of Scoot over to the Hangar RC, www.hangarc.com, and see what they've uh, they've got about three or four uh, planes up there and ready to go. They've got free PDFs for download, and if you'd like, and one of the things I, I urge you to try is uh, check out their skins, or you can get a quick kit. Um, they ship them out pretty quickly. I think uh, they have about a one or two day turnaround and three day uh, shipping in the continental U.S., so uh, you'll get it to your door very quickly, usually within a week. Uh, Sam does a great job. And we're going to do it uh, on Friday, November 13th, uh, 2020, and uh, between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we kind of moved it up from the 14th because I have a conflict, sadly. Uh, I don't know why I didn't see it. Um, but it's a Cub Scout outing, so I will be in the wilderness and unable to do really much anything. Uh, so we moved it to Friday, so I can be there too. Yep. Um, it, go ahead. Well, I was, <clears throat> was going to say, and um, anybody who is purchasing anything from the Hangar RC, if you choose to do so, uh, you can use the uh, discount code that we have is uh, 
ARCN-B1. That's 10% off the entire store, good until November 30th, and we'll have that uh, discount code in the show notes. Mm -hmm. That's ARCN-BN1. Awesome. Very good. So I guess that brings us... uh, Oh, we've confirmed that the voicemail works. So uh, go over to the Anchor dot fm aviation rc noob and click the message button and leave us a message we'll play it on the air and uh you'll hear us respond to it and in that light uh we did have a comment come in on itunes matthew you want to talk about that one yeah sure um and i think this is one of our first itunes comments or at least the the one that we kind of noted here uh almost not a noob um, posted a comment and said, and I quote, these guys are great. They have great stories to share. I really like that they're humble enough to share their missteps and how to fix them. Matt and Joe uh, make you want to get out and fly more. And I tell you what, I really appreciate the feedback and uh, it makes me good. I feel good that that's pretty much what we're aiming for. And I'm glad it's getting across. And thanks yeah. for leaving a message at iTunes that uh, usually helps other people find us. So we appreciate it. Yep, it's one of the one of the few comments we've gotten on the iTunes side of things, <clears throat> and uh, we we appreciate you reached out and left a comment and let us know your your thoughts on the show, and we appreciate awesome. it. Yeah, so I guess that leaves us to our main topic, doesn't it? It is. So why don't we start off with our uh, scary stories or our mishaps okay. and Ooh. frights in the hobby, and then we'll we'll get into the stories that uh, folks have written or given us audio for awesome sounds like a good plan all right well i'm i I think we're gonna start off with the like minor stuff and then kind of work into the scarier and scarier stuff so by the time we're done um if uh hopefully you'll you'll at least see uh why we were we were probably um incredibly nervous while these things were happening so uh first one was um using a weighted rope um i would trying to get a spitfire out of a tree and I had a nylon rope and I put a big weight on it so I could get it up near the top where the, the plane was stuck. And as I threw it, I nearly, uh, I, I had a friction burn enough to give me a solid blister. So, you know, uh, I've talked about it before. This is kind of one of those things that I didn't realize how much it could really burn you. Um, so if you get a chance and that's something you're going to try, make sure to have a glove with you, like a, a work glove or something like that. So you don't burn your skin. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing, I don't know about you, but when I'm building, I'm especially in the middle of the summer, like I'm in shorts and sometimes a t-shirt and I almost never have any socks on. So I'm building barefoot and it's easy to set down the build knife, um, the number 11 hobby knife and have that thing start to roll off the edge while you're focused on holding a part yeah. while the glue, <laughs> while the glue cools <laughs> and you're sitting there watching it go and you're like, uh oh, this is going to be bad. I'll tell you what, uh, I have moved my feet sideways fast as you can say, uh oh, <laughs> um, as that knife goes. And I've had that thing stick point down into the floor, sticking straight up or at an angle as it went and drove into the floor. And that mm. could have easily been, on many occasions, it could have easily been my feet. Um, uh, and now that's not going to send you to the hospital or have you get any stitches probably, but you'll definitely be bleeding and you, you may need to, uh, you may need to get a band aid for sure. Um, well, so definitely disinfect it as well. Cause I mean, all the things that you cut with those knives. Yeah. That and, be, that's probably not a problem, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, on the know, good side know, of, of things, course. you got a nasty cut on the bad side. You, you can get an infection yeah, and possibly get... need those stitches. Um, but, yeah. So far, and I've I've had them roll off the table on me before too. So far, mm-hmm. uh, no major incidents there. Right, uh, I'm with you. Um, so, oh, and another thing is, if you're pulling, um, if you're cut, making a cut with a uh, with a ruler, the temptation is to go fast, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you're gonna try that, before you pull, make sure your fingers are out of the way. I used to, uh, in my school, we used to make architectural models and people would slice their fingertips nearly off doing rapid cuts like that. So if, and, and it's easy to do with foam board. So if you're doing that, please, before you pull that cut, 
make sure your finger's out of the way. Um, cause that will definitely need stitches and you don't really need to be going to the hospital with a bloody plane in your hand. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I think the other, oh, another thing that I've done and it's really dumb. I mean, it's really, really done it. And every time I've successfully done it, I think, I don't know why I didn't get cut. Um, is using a finger to kind of push a twitchy motor just enough to get it kind of working. Um, and that usually that's probably because of some poorly soldered connection or something like that, especially in my case. Um, all I wanted to do is get it going so I could get it flying and it just isn't worth the finger that you might get cut. So if you see a twitchy motor, pull the thing out of service, reflow the solder, make sure it's not twitching anymore. It, that's not that hard. I know it's disappointing, but it's a lot better than a, than a cut finger. It is. And I want to get, I want to bring up a, a knife story and this isn't necessarily hobby related, although I'm still using the same basic knife. Um, mm-hmm. I do want to preface that you know, while, while these are, these first couple are like crazy uh, stories, it's to be a reminder that, you know, even though we're having fun in this hobby and their foam or their, their small motors, like, it can result in some harm, even when we're building or just, mm-hmm. uh, you know, doing our thing. So just, it, these are just stories right now to be, you know, careful and keep those kind of things in mind. Um, so re- recently I've been, again, still remodeling the bedroom, but we started hanging the wallpaper and as, without getting into the difficulties of peeling stick wallpaper, um, once we <laughs> once we place to the wall and bring it on down, I need to cut off the excess at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, so we kind of do a quick little cut of that off to get it off, and I went back to kind of cut that, that last little bit off to get it lined up with the floor molding. As I was cutting down by the trim, uh, like the side of my face itched or something, and this mm. is an awareness story. So I'm sitting there <laughs> cutting. It's like, oh man, my face itches. So it's just like kick the, you know, flip the knife backwards in your hand without thinking and reach up and go scratch your face and you kind of finish scratching. It's like, okay, that's better. I pulled my hand away and look and realize I had had that knife like right up here by my face and wouldn't have, yeah. didn't even realize that you're just, you know, you're going along. Oh, my face itches. And you reach up and scratch and could have had a, uh, a, Knife. Bad situation on my hands just because I had an itch on my face. So be mindful yeah. of your your tools positioning. And some of it is, I was sitting on the the concrete in the bedroom and was doing these cuts, and I didn't want to set the knife down. Uh, I'm sure is what went through my mind at the time. So I don't want to set it down. I want like take the time. Just I'll scratch my face real quick, and I really should mm-hmm. just pass it off to my other hand so I didn't have to worry about it. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, there's a couple times I've brought my same kind of deal put put my finger up to my face to scratch and i look and right in front of my eyeball is the tip of the number 11 plate kind of sitting there at the angle and i'm like what the heck was i thinking i could have i mean if you know if i well obviously you weren't (laughs) no i wasn't i was just think i was thinking i have to itch you know oh i'll tell you um you know one of the things you can do and i don't know if they make them but um, you know those little rubber grippy things that they have for pencils? Yeah. I think they've got kind of squarish ones. It might be worthwhile to get one of those and stick it on the back of the X-Acto blade if you've got one of those round. Uh, or get a square one, for that matter. Uh, that way it so doesn't don't roll. roll. Yeah. Uh, okay. So at least at some point it stops rather than gaining more momentum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah. I'll have to look into one of those. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think I did too. Um, I suppose you could kind of cut a hole in some foam board and stick it on the end. I mean, yeah, that's true. There's low cost, low cost solutions, but uh, I've never used one. I always keep forgetting to do that. So, um, let's see. Oh, uh, another one I like to do, and I say I like to do. I don't like to do it. I just I'm impatient when a plane gets really close to being built. I want to check to make sure that the surfaces are going right and that the throttle stick and all the controls are working the way I want. And rather than like bring it outside or honestly, usually I'm doing it. It's about 11 o'clock at night or midnight. And so I'm not looking to uh, wake anybody up. 
So what I'll do is I'll do a taxi test in my front hallway. And a matter of fact, I've, I've got a couple of videos uh, of examples of that. Um, and it's usually not a huge deal. But every once in a while, if I'm messing with a throttle channel, so I've got the thing down, I've got it plugged in, and I've realized that something, some switch is off, like it's not in the right spot or it's not up versus down or something. So to scroll to the right position, you have to go through throttle. And so what happens is all of a sudden your throttle stick moves all the way through all the different channels on your switches. And some switches are 100% and some are zero, you know, negative 100. So what happens as you're scrolling through, the throttle starts kicking on. And if you're not prepared for that and you don't have your plane locked down or there's not a pro you know if you're like me and do it with a prop on it just to make sure you've got the prop spinning the correct way <clears throat> it it becomes a yeah i don't know all i know is my heart jumps a bit and i pucker a, a little uh as i see this thing coming at me uh going a full tilt because i can't switch that little that option back around to the throttle uh channel three uh quick enough and so oh. I had one that came right at me and I, I kicked the darn thing out of the way with my foot uh, just, just so that it wouldn't hit me. And then I finally got it around back to channel three. So we, it was back to the 0% that it needed to be. Um, but in the meantime, I had to go through switch A, switch B, switch C, switch D, switch, you know, and all the different channels. <laughs> and I was doing it quick. But I'll tell you what. It, so it was like 100%, zero, you know, nothing, 50%. 100%. <laughs> so you were trying to program or set up program. A, a switch on your transmitter to do something on the plane and right. you had to you had to roll it through different settings and yeah. you got to go through a list and in the, okay, I got you. Yeah, and like, why, as it's rolling literally rolling through that list of options, it's going through everything's whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and and so meanwhile the motor is is go in at different percentages and I'll tell you <laughs> so okay so if you're going to like test your do your testing you know make sure you're safe and we'll get over other ways to test we've done it before like you know make sure it's pointing away from you that kind of thing uh, take um, your prop off yeah take your prop off that's a that's a good one so but if you're going to do that like disconnect the battery disconnect the battery just make sure that when you're moving all your switches and you're reorienting that stuff turn turn that stuff off so that way it couldn't possibly jump at you. Mm -hmm. And then when you're done, reconnect it back up and see if that was successful. Um, here's a, here's a question. Yeah. How, how feasible is it to, how feasible is it to put an inline switch on your ESC wire? Like uh, a throw switch. Okay. It, it is. And, and they use that all the time in RC cars. They'll have an e, uh, an on-off switch as part of the ESC, and it's like a separate line that goes out to a little switch. Now, what I understand, and this is not from my experience at all. This is listening to people <clears throat> who are in the hobby a while. Uh, they say that after a while, those switches fail. And when they fail, now you've got a constant run of juice rolling through your stuff. And maybe with an RC car, it's not a huge deal. But mm -hmm. with a plane, that could be really dangerous. So most people have planes. Some have switches, but most of them are like, yeah, I don't, I'm not even going to mess with it because it's just not reliable. And mm -hmm. I find that, I, I guess I was surprised to hear that. Um, and that's, that's what I think most of the reason for that. Yeah, I know that any switch has a... Uh, lifetime number of switches that it can do. Um, but I wouldn't imagine that. Mm -hmm. I, I would not have thought that, that we'd that be, you'd be switching flying a, a plane switch. long enough. <laughs> well, be flying a plane long enough or put a switch through enough cycles on a plane to, to wear it out. But Right. I would think the same thing. But again, I guess the, the risk just isn't worth it, uh, hmm. generally speaking. Okay. I don't know. Your mileage may vary. My thought is, is um, the switch should be just like the battery hatch. Just make sure the battery hatch is closed or is open. If, and that should be that little contact between the magnets should be your on switch or mm. something like that. You know, I don't know how reliable that is. Yeah. Well, talking about um, 
engines jump into life when, and I think I, yeah, I mentioned this in an earlier episode, but when, mm. uh, some time ago I was up at my father-in-law's house and we were building a simple cub and, Oh yeah, right. I, I forget what part of it I was trying to program. Uh, we were, I had to flip one of the controls, uh, mm-hmm. and I had to do that in, in the transmitter. Uh, so I had to, you know, put the sticks in a certain position and turn it on and watch the blinky light and have the manual out. And I was working on reversing one of the, the controls so that instead of going left or went right or whatever it was. Um, right. Yeah. And it could have been the elevator. Which, I don't remember. Right. But, and you weren't familiar with his transmitter at all. No. Right. It was, that was the, the low DX, end version of the DX six or something. Yeah. DX5 yeah. Five or something. It, yeah. It was the one that he got uh, when he bought the the power pod system, I think, where he bought the power pod, but mm-hmm. then also bought the starter, you know, transmitter from flight test. So yeah, uh, right. Not to say it wasn't a good transmitter, just it was a no, little awkward. Just, you're to not familiar with it, so uh, and I have that problem with the T8. Like I don't use the T8SG much, uh, the jumper, but that's what I have set up as my buddy box for my kids, mm-hmm. and it's a pretty unusual menu system and to switch something i have to go about four layers deep to get there and i can't always remember what the heck that sequence is to get to it so i'm sitting there going like if i could just remember how to switch it it's a simple thing where is it (laughs) anyway so you were doing the same thing yeah uh, and messing with that and at some point during that whole process um i somehow because I had the plane turned on, um, and I think it was because I was doing it, but also binding it. Somehow or another, I had gone. I had entered the programming mode of the ESC, and oh. during all that, or during the bind, I had the throttle. At some point, I programmed the ESC to have its fail state at uh, throttle, say thirty or fifty percent. Um, oh. And I didn't notice it until I turned the transmitter off and the motor jumped uh-huh. to life. <laughs> which I'm oh, fairly no. certain. Yeah. Oh no. I've done that too. I've done that too. Oh, that's mm. so scary. I'm fairly certain that I had the, the prop off. So just the motor jumped to life and, you know, both you know, my father-in-law and I, and then my brother-in-law who's you know, sitting there helping us build uh, for the day. We all kind of jerked it. Whoa. But, you know, fortunately, again, I'm pretty sure the prop was off. It's been a little while. And I felt bad. I I had said back when we talked about it the first time that I had left him with the ESC program that way because I didn't realize what was happening. Um, and then later I figured it out, so I called him. Uh, but he didn't end up ever getting the chance to do it. So the last time I was up there, we reset the failsafe on his right, ESC. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's the thing is I I've, I've done that too because I've heard like oh set it to you know you want it to the if it hits a brownout you're flying right. Mm-hmm. You want it to, if it's browning out because of signal loss, and like maybe a dead spot and or an interference spot or something in the middle of your field or wherever you're flying, that the one of the suggestions was bring it down to like 30% throttle. That way it doesn't nose down, but it, it so it kind of, it'll descend and, and like a little bit of rudder or something like that. That way it, it'll start turning. You know, you'll, right. you'll see that it's doing something you didn't expect, but eventually it'll come back around to you. And with any luck, it's getting close enough where you can regain signal and then get your plane back. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, that sounds like a great idea until I turned my plane off and I, and, uh, I you turned turn the transmitter, transmitter off, <laughs> right? Because I was like, oh, cool. I'm done. And I don't know why I was in the habit of doing this, but I, I don't do it now. Um, because of this incident. I turned the transmitter off and the plane went, oh, it's a brownout. Wee, 30% and started to go. And at that point I had like had the prop on and I was just, you know, cause I was just looking to, I, I'm done. I'm ready to pack it away. And it's just, that was the order of operations. Yeah. Oh my God, that scared the crap out of me. It really, um, really scared me a lot. And before we move on to your, your next story, I, for clarification, when we're saying brown out here, we're talking about signal loss. I think brown out mm-hmm. is when you have a, a low power situation, like not enough power to drive everything. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose you know, when you're pulling too much voltage through where the receiver doesn't get five volts. Mm-hmm. So it loses connection temporarily. Yeah. That's right. I just want to make sure that, you know, 
we're talking signal loss situations, not, you know, loss of power. Right. Good um, point. But yeah, with that, you know, while you're, while you're working on your plane and I didn't do it for a long time and I've started doing it where I take the prop mm-hmm. off, just take your prop take off it, while you're off. experimenting with your plane. Right. It doesn't take long. Um, and just as a separate note, if you're working on it and you don't have to have it facing you, turn it away from you. Heaven forbid you, I don't know, something happens. Maybe there is a prop on it or something. Make sure it's facing away and not towards anything or anybody that could get hurt by it. Just that way, if it does come to life and start going, it's not going to hurt anything. Mm-hmm. You know, just it's simple, just mindfulness, I think. Um, simple uh, mindfulness I that, that many of us don't do. Like, I put the prop on the plane while I was sitting in the back of my car, pointed out the back, and I'm standing mm-hmm. out the back of my car. You yeah. know, it's. But being aware of it in that moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the truth. It, it's, I mean, it's easy to do. And it's inconvenient to be like, oh, do I have to take the prop off? It's like, yes, yes. Uh, more inconvenient is to have to go to the hospital. So think about it that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, okay, I think the next story is something I think we briefly covered um, and it was one of those things. It was just like almost a perfect storm. I've got a small video of it in the very beginning of the buddy box track for my Spitfire. And uh, it was when I transferred the controls from, I think, my um, my original transmitter, the radio, the radio link, and I transferred over the T16. And then, of course, because of that, the settings were a little different and the channels were... Anyway, it was a lot I was trying to figure out at the time. And so I was just trying to get it so it flew like it did on the radio link. Um, And when I released it from my hand, I was, you know, the guys were working on the field. And the one guy had his puppy with him who was, you know, the puppy was minding his own business. Um, And just as I'm releasing the plane, the puppy starts kind of running out towards me. And I thought, no big deal, except the the Spitfire rolled over and started to nose into the ground right Mm -hmm. where the puppy was running. And I, oh my God, I, I've never been so nervous and so scared for, for the puppy and for where the plane was going. I was like, oh no. Um, you know, I just, I redirected the controls to make sure it was not going to hit the ground anywhere near where the puppy was going to go just in case. Um, and it was just one of those things like try to be mindful of what's around you. And, you know, when there's things you don't have control over, do your best to keep clear of it. And it just happened to be some craziness. Like I really expected that plane to come out of my hands. Cause that's all it had ever done at that point is just come out of my hands straight level and just off it goes and everything would have been great. Um, but you know, just that's Murphy's law says it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, just, just remember, you know, like animals and stuff, they don't, they don't know what you're doing. They just know that you're a source of good, good love and pets. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, just be aware. Um, it, I will cut in on something just, no, just sure. for something a little lighter. Um, I was scroll, I was scrolling through Facebook and, uh, one of the, I think it might've been the, the flight test fans page, um, somewhere on social media, I saw it. They were, uh, they were about to launch a, uh, F-16, foam uh, i think it was a foamy with edf it looked like mm-hmm. one of the the f-16 i don't think it's the blue angel but it was that white with the red um okay I, i've got a little not quite a hot wheels but that same type like hard yeah. metal little figurine of it um and they were getting ready <laughs> they were getting ready to launch it but a dog that you know liked to play fetch was out there with them and so it kind of saw them winding up for the chuck of the plane and you could see him dancing, getting ready. And right as they went to chuck it, he went, pull, pushed up full throttle and right as it left the dude's hand, so the dog jumped up and snatched it right out of the air, pulled it down. Um, oh man. You know, which fortunately was an EDF. So he didn't have a prop spinning in his face, but yeah. Still. Anyway, a little sidestep there, but something I'd seen. Go ahead. Yeah, right. An- another hazard to the field, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, that's and so I guess that kind of brings me to my Prandtl D Maiden. Um, after I'd done the glide test, everything looked like it was good. I put a motor on it, and uh, 
I remember earlier that day it was calm, but by the time I got out to the field, it was like really windy and a storm was on its way. But I really wanted to make, I don't know. I just didn't. Anyway, it was too windy. I released the plane and hit full throttle, but the wind gust had kind of pulled the bottom of the plane up. And I, I think I, I might not have had enough nose weight. Again, I still hadn't sussed out the exact you know, CG or what works with the thrust angle. I, I may not have had that right. Anyway, the plane loops way up and over and starts nosing down directly. And that's so up and over the flight line and behind where the pits are. And it starts coming nose straight down into the pits, which oh, is no. where everybody was hanging out and talking. Yeah. So I didn't know what to do except yell four. <laughs> and I mean, it, it landed about two feet away from a guy. And I'm fortunately, uh, it didn't hurt anybody. I mean, we kind of scared and I, I'll tell you what, I was terrified. I mean, I had knots in my stomach and I was like, Oh my God, they're going to ask me to like, never come back to the field. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh no. And I'm so, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he's like, yeah, man, it's, it's part of it. Like it's what it is. At least you um, hollered. Yeah, I, I try. <laughs> I try to give some sort of warning, you know. Uh, anyway, but yeah, so if you're going to make a plane, like, be, be careful of, like, who's around and think about how it could go wrong. Um, and, you know, try try not to let it be on a windy day. I mean, that, unless you're doing a slope soar, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, uh, another one is uh, one of the things that always kind of terrifies me is if I'm in a plane... Um, it's always something like when I'm coming in for that last turn to land and, you know, it's kind of coming around and it's facing the pits as it comes around mm -hmm. and you're, you're about to like level it out and bring it down. I always just am so scared that either there'll be a brownout, um, or like the control surface will give or something and I'll lose like control of the plane and it'll continue on the vector of heading right into the pits um, at like, you know, pretty much full tilt, uh, especially if you're doing like a low, a low speed fast pass or something like that. Like right. I always just get terrified that something like that's going to happen. So like if you, unless you really know your plane, just it's probably not worth the risk. Or, you know, if you're going to do something like that, you know, make sure nobody's in the pits over there, you know? Um, but just, the pits are terrible. supposed to be, as I understand a, a flying field, layout and i've not been to one uh the pits are sort of like behind where you're supposed to be flying right right so there's like a an imaginary line in front of the and and in front of the i'll call it rc stands and they're usually mm -hmm. like a a u-shaped corral um and that offers a modicum of protection for the people for the pilots who are up at the flight line and then behind that is like the pits area where people kind of have their planes and are working on them. And then there's like a, a protective fence so that the public can, can watch. Um, so, uh, I mean, so it's unlikely, but again, if you're doing a rollover and it's literally coming down from like a loop, you know, there's, there's no protection against that. Um, and those fences typically are only about like, you know, waist high or chest high, four feet maybe. So they really don't, I mean, it comes right at you. Um, and if you're, if you're high enough, uh, it's not going to protect you. It, it protects from like a uh, runaway ground craft. You know, like if you land and it goes out of control and it starts skidding off to the side towards the cars and the people watching right. like that, it's to protect that. Okay. Well, I guess in, in that same kind of, uh, I guess, feeling of transmitter errors um one that's pretty common actually um or i know i'm not alone if you're like me and you have a strap um because you worry that i don't know maybe you'll panic and release your transmitter and let it go to the ground or you launch with one hand and and want to use the transmitter with the other um i use a strap so one of the things that when i'm getting a plane together is the transmitter as I'm leaning over the plane, it's kind of bouncing around. And uh, if you're like me and couldn't figure out a throttle kill switch properly, um, I was on one of the planes, I guess, that I hadn't set it up with. And I it bumped against my body. 
and the throttle moved up to maybe 20, 30 percent, pretty low. Mm -hmm. But I'm leaning over this plane as the propeller jumps to life. Now, I was probably about a minute and a half away from putting this on the runway and sending it up in the air. So it was pretty much ready to go. And I, you know, I could have cut myself uh, pretty good if I hadn't, I don't know, been kind of uh, far enough away to have time to get out of the way or at least grab hold of the plane really quick so it didn't actually, you know, uh, go anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's what I ended up doing. And then I, you know, bumped the throttle back down and, and everything was fine. I just, I'll tell you what, it gave me a fright though. Uh, I could feel the, uh, you know, that feeling when you go over a bump? Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, little, that oh. was a feeling I had. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, yeah. I mean, I've done that before. Um, been, been having the, had the plane in my hand and not paying attention to a transmitter or let the transmitter go. And, you know, so before I got a belly, so mine will get into that throttle arm and, uh, you know, bump it up. I'm flipping the plane around, having to look at some things. And all of a sudden my belly bumps it up to, you know, quarter throttle and there goes the prop so <laughs> uh, that is specifically why i have a throttle kill switch that i it. generally keep killed until i'm ready to actually fly right uh, so i guess the public service announcement that goes with that one is figure out how to do a kill switch and set it set mm -hmm. it up the same for every single plane uh every profile that you have on there make sure that they're all like for me i have switch a away so because the defaults are all all the switches are up so when i have the default set up i can't turn my t16 transmitter really on and connecting until all the switches are in the off and safe position and then i right. know my on all my transmitters that upper left switch is my on off switch mm -hmm. so, and uh, mine's the same way if i turn it on and there's and that took me a couple a few minutes to figure out. I thought I'd broken my transmitter when I went to turn my transmitter on one time, and it's just sitting there beeping at me about switch air. Switch air? What? Mm -hmm. um, but then did some Googling and found out, oh, you didn't have all your switches in the right spot. Um, so, yeah, like, have a, have a kill switch set up. Fortunately, yeah. uh, I know my transmitter will not... Uh, so it'll come on, it'll connect, but my receiver will not... Um, my receiver or my ESC will not receive or it won't it won't Arm. accept anything, it won't do anything until my uh throttle returns to zero. So if I turn my transmitter on and, and my it's throttle somewhere in the middle. Up, okay. Right. My my ESC will sit there and buzz my motor and it'll go beep bzz, beep 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 and I'll, what's wrong with my plane? And then Yeah, um, and you look down. <laughs> return the throttle to zero. <laughs> and and um, it goes beep 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 beep. Yep, beep, it beep. it just won't even go through the uh the all the other tones yeah. until the throttles at zero, and so what like how I continue to keep my throttle kill set up, and this may not be feasible for every situation, but so mm. far I've been able to like I'm still running off my old fogey profile, the first, yeah. first one I ever set up. <laughs> um, you copy it and move it to the next, yeah. Yeah, I, I just copy it over to a to a new slot, change the name to whatever the model is, and then I start making my adjustments to what I'm after, whether it be you know certain throws are reversed or setting up different uh, throw reductions. And but it, so at that point, it carries over all the trim, it carries over all the settings. In fact, I think yeah. uh, my Vulture profile has the uh, the the flapper on. Uh, programming from my Spitfire, you know, <laughs> even though there's the no time, ailerons, <laughs> right? But the only time that that the, the flaperons activate is when I throw the gear switch. So it's just this side right. thing that's not in there that I don't necessarily have to worry about unless I throw that switch. So maybe I should go in there and clean, clean that up. Uh, um, I mean, look, if the, I guess my take is, if you don't have anything connected to those switches, it's not a big deal, right? Uh, I've got, I use my Spitfire for my three channels, you know, um, mm -hmm. because I set up, uh, I put my elevator and rudder as if they were the elevator and aileron on the Spitfire. 
right. and all the other channels for the flap rons and the landing gear and all the other nonsense like that stuff doesn't do anything on the three channel mm -hmm. planes. So it doesn't matter, but it does have a little bit of just a tiny bit of mix of as the throttle goes up, the elevator goes just a hair down. So that way it kind of compensates for the natural tendency for, I guess, um, as, as you speed up, you get more lift. So you go up and then the right. elevator kind of compensates for that. So, uh, anyway, but I mean, that stuff doesn't hurt to have that. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to clean it up, so it's just the way you like it, that's not a bad idea. Uh, next one is one, uh, it was, I'll call it my early days. It is, uh, some of my early successes and yet I'll tell you what, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I didn't do more, more damage than I did. I had made the bloody Baron. I made a yellow one with a uh, tape. It looked great. I flew it around. It flew like a dream. And then I tried to take it out the next time and something was wrong with it. I couldn't figure it out. I was like, okay, we'll get it. And then I, I put the throttle up high to get it to take off the ground. It took off the ground, but I had to use a lot of elevator to do it. And it went straight up. The throws were way too high. So it mm. was like all or nothing, left, right, up, down, like crazy. <laughs> so I just like, what the heck? And I pulled it up and it went straight up. And of course it has unlimited vertical. So it's going. And then I, you know, at that point I had like kind of tapped the throttle. So it went back to neutral, uh, the elevator. So it went back to neutral. And so it's just going straight up for a while. I'm like, ah, let me, let me turn that down. So I put full nose down and it starts coming down. And then I go, ah, and I let go of the stick again. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's coming straight down to the ground. I'm like, oh, no. Well, I didn't return to the sticks in time to save it. So it slams straight into the ground, nose first at like Oof. nearly full throttle. And I was like, oh, that's such a good plane. Well, it is a good plane because it's incredibly durable. It, I, I flew it for a long time after that. But what happened with it was the screws that mount the base of the motor through the firewall uh, and they basically were kind of like, I guess they were kind of wood screws. So they had a point, yeah. but there was like a, there's a nut that went on them. I guess they're a fine threaded wood screw. So they came to a point and they were all sticking inward. And then there was a battery, which was mounted a little bit far back. But when you slam it nose first into the ground at full speed, well, that battery needs us to say came loose and it slammed straight into the firewall into all of those screws, which punctured the case of the lipo. And I just kind of look at it like, oh, I just busted my plane. All of a sudden I see it start to smoke and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I'm catching the lipos on fire. Oh no. <laughs> well, I, so I run over there and I, I'm, I'm thinking like, what am I going to do now? If I have a battery that's on fire, where do I put it? So it doesn't catch like the soccer field on fire or the bridge or whatever it was. So I, I unplugged it and I pulled the, uh, I pulled the battery out of the plane as fast as I could. I kind of threw, I kind of threw the plane off to the side and I run, I ran that battery. Oh, I'm like, uh, pavement, pavement's not going to catch fire. Now as a civil engineer, I know that pavement catches fire. I've seen it. It, really? it actually happens. Yeah. It takes a lot, but I was thinking lipo fire, well, it's a lot better than the grass, which will catch fire right. quicker. So I went out to the park lot, I threw it into the park lot, and I just watched. <laughs> and I just like, uh, and I, I'm thinking like, what am I going to do? Like, if it catches fire, would I just watch? Um, and <laughs> that essentially, so that's, what I, that's pretty much what I did, though. But so fortunately, the damage I did was only to one cell, because I guess it just the the two. Uh, screws punctured the bottom cell of the three cell battery. And so mm -hmm. that cell puffed and smoked, but I guess I hadn't done enough damage where it had a runaway reaction and didn't catch fire. So I just waited and eventually the smoke stopped and I, uh, I think I emptied the lipo bag and put that in the lipo bag and drove home uh -huh. as fast as I could. <laughs> I took it out and I like, sat it on my porch or something so that even if it caught fire, it wasn't going to do any damage. It might've been smoke. I might have to do some cleaning, but it would have been fine. Um, so from that point forward, all of my mounting screws go out towards the motor and not in towards where the battery sits. 
I mean, that's the moral of the story. Um, yeah, I did end I, up reusing that battery and made it a two cell. So and it I wasn't think, all bad. I think some motors may just mount with their screws in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that's going to be the case, uh, take a little hot glue. Because I think I had to do this on the... Um, no, I didn't have to do it with the with the Vulture because it was still my motor. But just mm-hmm. if you've got screws pointing inside the pod, just take a dab of hot glue and kind of drop it on those points. Um, and it's mm-hmm. going to cover up those points. You can you know scrape the glue off later if you need to, but that's going to uh, blunt those those sharp points off so you don't have that yeah. potential problem. Uh, I've also taken a couple extra layers of foam board. And kind of mm-hmm. push them over top of the screws as well, doing the same kind of thing. I figured if the battery hits, it's going to hit the full face of that that foam board pad, okay, as it were. And it'll compress some, but it won't compress a ton. And it should be enough to kind of reduce what's going to happen. So, and and that's been pretty successful because I've had a couple crashes using that um, safety method, and it has worked. But uh, yeah, if you can face them the other way. Just, it's probably the best way. All right, going on to my next one. I've got, uh, you know, we, we kind of talked about before, but the Spitfire that I lost, uh, which you've been doing repairs on. Um, mm-hmm. It's ready to go. I, I, I need to run that. through the, yeah, I can't wait for you to try it again. <laughs> um, so this was the same day that we were uh, made in flying test fly in the Vulture and the, uh, the HRC Vulture and HRC. Uh, seven. You and I decided to let's also get the Spitfires up there because we first time I think we could really fly a boat together. Or no, it was the second time. But I I was time. borrowing your CPAC radio. We were looking mm-hmm. forward to being able to do some formation flying and such. Yeah, yeah. And um, long story short, uh, I was flying it further out than I thought I was. Um, it got in a good oh. ways out there, and we were already. Not silhouette flying, but it was getting uh, a little dark. It was was, close. It it was close. (laughs) It was getting darker, and it was just, I didn't realize how far out there it was. And that's Uh, the thing is, when the planes are up high, there's no reference point. Right. So you can't really tell um, distance from you, like Mm -hmm. where the plane is in reference to anything. That's part of the reason why aerial combat is so difficult from the ground is because there's no reference to tell if you're in plane with another craft or are you behind it or in front or mm-hmm. it's almost very difficult to tell until you go past it. Right. You pass something right. else. So long story short, I ended up losing signal. Um, I, I think it was that we had, I was flying, I was flying over a neighborhood that was behind the school that we were flying. And we were flying in their big, yep nice big open grounds uh which should have been plenty of room but i let it get further away than i thought i did (laughs) and apparently i was flying right over the top of that neighborhood um and looking back i think it was the wi-fi networks in the area because they run wi-fi runs at Mm 2.4 and 5 gigahertz so it's probably interfering and i lost signal and i knew it when it happened because it also happened with vulture um which fortunately the vulture crashed close to you know on our side of the tree line uh mm-hmm. but i was just you and you had just said joe you need to you need to bring it in and then i said it's, it's further I, up than you think <laughs> i said i have no control matt <laughs> um, <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah and i'm just watching this plane go and kind of cut a cut to the side and as i was trying to get yeah. some inputs like it was acting like maybe it got a little bit and then it was just gone and the only right. thing I could do is I pulled throttle back to zero and just yanked straight back on the stick, and it just went where it was going to go. I had no control, um, and I had to go hunting for it and walk across school field well, through the tree line, through a drainage ditch, up into the neighborhood, and then go looking for it, trying to figure out where did this thing go down. And that walk, that walk is the is worst a walk. Of walk. Shame. <laughs> it's not even a walk of shame. It's a walk, walk of terror. It is. Like, yeah. It, it, you just don't know because you don't know where it went down. You don't know what it hit, who, what happened. Like, 
did is there going to be somebody who's really angry or you're standing to, out there holding my plane waiting right? for is, me <laughs> i mean anything like it could have been anything and you just because you don't know what it could be your mind's rolling through the worst mm-hmm. the worst things you know like what if i ran into a baby or something like i don't know i'm just like ah yeah. if, if i, I hit the somebody's same... if i hit somebody's kid if i yeah uh you know hit knocked out a window if it went down and somebody, because once I got over to that neighborhood, I realized there's, everybody's got a privacy fence. So yeah, if it went down inside somebody's yard, I'm not going to find it. Is it on top of somebody's house? Or then once I yeah. kind of broke through the backyards, passed between two very tightly packed privacy fences and broke still... out into the front yards and look around, I'm like, these are some nice cars. Um, yeah. Not, not that a nice <laughs> car makes it. But, you know, worse no, off than but, a, a bad, you know. A, a, no, a, but the repairs are a lot more expensive. That's <laughs> yeah, but yeah. You know, so you're walking around uh, trying. Oh man, where did my plane go? What damage did I do? And um, I I eventually ended up found. I, I found it. It had um, mm-hmm. it had apparently slammed into a privacy fence. I found it like two rows over uh, behind right. somebody's yard. It was in like this. To get to it, I ended up going on like the uh, maintenance route that was between the two sets of backyards. Like it's yeah, you... not a road that you access. No, um, I I still am beside myself that you found it there. That you found <laughs> it, and that's where it was. Like both of those are pretty amazing to me. <laughs> yeah, and again, it it looked like it slammed up against the fence, um, and the. The plane broke in half. the The wing was boogered up a bit, which I know you've been doing repair work on it. And mm-hmm. surprisingly, the prop did not break. That blew my mind. <laughs> blew my mind too. I'm like, the wait, the prop is what? Yeah. Oh my god, this is so, crazy. I know uh, you had I, come. I'm, go ahead. Uh, I know you had hopped in your car after you packed everything up and got the boys in the car and drove over to the neighborhood was looking for me. And then you finally yeah. looked and I had left my phone in the trunk of your car. So I, like, I you couldn't call me. <laughs> oh man. I know. It was just, and I, I like, I wanted to console you. I want to say like, dude, I know, I know how you feel. Like, I know how you feel. It, it, it you know, just, you don't, don't get too worried until you see it. Like, wait it'll be okay it'll it'll mm-hmm. probably be a lot better than you think just hang in there <laughs> and you were you know and and the reason why i know is i had a bloody baron right i'm flying at my flying field which again is like some 40 acre farm it's massive and th- there's a road to get there um and across the road is a series of houses and it's not a lot of them because behind those is another 40 acre field or something like that so I'm flying my Baron and I'm having a, I must've been tail heavy or something. It was, it was really squirrely. And every time I thought it was coming to me, it was actually going away. I lost orientation and it kept being between 20 feet and like 50 feet, which is the danger zone. Uh, it was not three accidents high, even close. And I'm still <laughs> trying to, I'm like trying to bring it back around. And the guy's like, Hey man, you know, you ought to like, you're getting pretty far out there. You might want to bring it back. And I'm like, Oh, I'm try- I'm trying. I'll, I'll I'll get it. It'll be great. And and then I saw the plane dip below the roof line of the house across the street. This is oh, no. about 300 feet away, at least if not more. Um, no wait, it's got to be more because the runway is 800 feet long. Um, so based on that, it's for it's it was probably about a thousand feet away. Okay. And again, the whole time it's flying almost like at field level. So it dips behind the house and I'm sitting there like, I don't know what's behind the house. Like, I don't know. Is there a pool? Are there kids? Is there a dog? Like, oh, geez, what am I, what am I doing? And right. I, at that second I went underneath, I'm like, I cut the throttle. I just turned it to the right. So it dump and I just crossed my fingers and that drive, that walk, that, that going up to their house, that time was the worst, the mm-hmm. worst time. Cause I just didn't know. Did I bust through a window? Did I, did I hurt somebody? Did I hurt some animal or like, what the heck? I, oh my God. And I didn't think so, but you just don't know until you get there and see ended up. It was just in their backyard, just kind of hanging out on the ground. I think I broke a prop, but I think I replaced the prop and away I flew like the next day. 
right. the lady was really nice. We invited her over to have some pizza at the field and all that kind of stuff. It was it was good, <laughs> but I mean, that whole drive, that whole walk up to her house to knock on the door and let her know that I'm an idiot. <laughs> you know, I'm a new guy and I stink at being a pilot. I was terrified. I, I mean, that's just the worst feeling. So when you were doing that walk, Joe, I was reliving that time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that that drive out to that lady's house to just go, oh my God, I hope nobody's hurt. I'm so sorry. Well, speaking of hoping not to get hurt, um, I did actually get hurt in this one, which will be my last story. Um, it It goes all the way back to being careful around your props and being mindful of them. And I should have known better. Um, but we were... I had been flying my Spitfire with my father-in-law. Uh, the last time I was up with him, we had been flying his Cub. Uh, I had flown it around. The, it was a little windier than I'd like it to be, and I had a rough landing and broke the prop. So, mm-hmm. you know, my father-in-law was, oh, no. And I said, it, it's fine. I'll, you know, take the take the prop nut off, slap a new prop on it, and uh, we'll be good to go. And I could have sworn... um. I could have sworn that we were that I was putting the same prop on that had come off, because um, I my motor's more of a quad motor, and so when I order props for it, I get left hand and right hand props. Right. And I thought that I was just down to the what I consider the wrong direction prop, because mm. I had just gone through Reverse and switched prop. the wires to uh, to get the motor spinning the other way. And so I put this other this other prop on. And we're getting ready to launch, and I go to throttle up, and I realize it's blow, you know, it's spinning the wrong way, like it's pushing air forward, not back. And it's one of those moments when you you're just so set in. I know what I put on there. This isn't like something else is wrong, not what I did, um, okay. or not that I'm thinking about the situation wrong. It. I took the throttle zero, I turned it up just a smidgen to um let the let the motor kind of do that bounce jerk that it does. Yeah. And watching I'm oh. like, yeah, it's it's going the wrong way. And so again, another situation of just being dumb. I stuck my finger in it to be, you know, in between the blades of the probably so I had it bouncing off one of my off my index finger. Like, maybe, it, maybe, no, it's definitely trying to go that way. Like, it wasn't turning yet, or if it was, it was just barely right. turning. Okay. Um, and I said, it, it's not supposed to be going this way. I flipped the wiring specifically so it would go the other way. And so I said, well, maybe if I give it a little more, I can get a little more throttle, I can get it to hit my finger and then bounce the other way, almost like you backfire the motor to get it going the other direction. I've, yeah, I know. Like some of the nitros or the the maybe the gassers can do it, um, oh, but Joe. I should have known better. ESC driven <laughs> electric motors only go one way. I'm and, wincing. If you can't yep, see me yep. do it, but I'm wincing. Uh, so I give it enough throttle, and it was kind of like bouncing back and forth around my finger, and I said, uh-huh. "Okay, I'll I, I pull it when I think that it's going the right way." But I felt it strike my finger again. As oh. I was pulling my finger out, so it started spinning the direction I didn't want it to go. And my dummy self said, oh, uh, it bounced off my finger. Now it's going the wrong way. I got to bounce it the other way. It just immediately went to stick my finger back in the prop to stop oh, no. it and get it going the other way. Oh, and as soon as, as soon as I went to stick my finger and that prop hit my finger, I said, that was dumb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That was dumb. Oh, um, oh my God. And yeah, it, it took a nice slice. Um, so it, that, it cut you. Yeah, that I think that was the first time, um, oh, like geez. outside of maybe handling a knife uh, in the hobby that I've drawn right. blood. Um, and it, it it bled for a little while. Um, I bet and, it did. Yeah, it was pretty deep. I'm sure. It, it was not, not as deep not quite as to it the could bone have been. Or anything. I'm right. It's yeah. not to the bone per se, but um, it, but it, it was. Fortunately, I didn't have it thro- revved up any higher than it was, and I didn't Thank like God. keep pushing my finger in. Like once it hit my finger and it knocked it back, I let it, <laughs> let my finger kind of go, and I, I was just like, "Man, that was 
dumb and then it stung like crazy because a oh. propeller's not like it's looks sharp until it actually tries to cut something like it's not intended for cutting um so oh. it was more of a tear than a cut but it oh, it yeah. went right through and um oh, boy i've learned my lesson don't like just simple don't, thing. don't stick, stick your, your finger, finger in a, in a running don't prop, do it <laughs> don't do it. oh my god even now i said oh, what was i thinking but i was trying oh, no. to get I was trying to get it to go the other way, and yeah. all I had to well, do was... if it bounced was... off your finger to go the wrong way, it clearly it'd go... Yeah. Like... You could do the same thing to go the right way. <laughs> so, I mean, all oh, I had man, to I'm do so to glad. fix that was what I ended up doing, which is pulling the power pod out, switching two wires on the ESC, and I was good to go. Right. It's a simple but... fix, but, but, oh my gosh. I'm so glad you didn't get hurt worse. Me too. I'm so glad. <laughs> oh, man, I'll tell you what, and that... I think that leads us to uh, my final story, and I think the final story that we're going to share of of our foolishness. Um, and again, uh, take all of these stories as kind of um, almost like a public service announcement, or or like don't do like I do, learn from my mistakes, take that with you as you go to be a stubborn jerk. Think about what we did because we were being either foolish, new in the hobby, or stubborn in your mindset or whatever and learn from it. Okay. Um, so what you're saying is do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know. That's just, I know that there's, there are moments you're going to just ignore it anyway and do what mm -hmm. you got to do. Cause you know, best and with any luck, then that learn when you learn from that, you hopefully sticks. Um, but if you can, learn from us so you don't make these mistakes. Um, and it seems like, you know, we're looking down the gambit short of having a plane run into us or somebody. I think we've done almost all the, all the pretty, pretty typical things that I've seen people talk about in the hobby. Um, my final story is um, a fantasy design challenge build. Actually it was a world war two design challenge build. Um, where it was a plane that was designed that didn't ever see service. Basically, take one of those, and one of the ones I chose was a napkin sketch uh, level drawing um, of the LPL Ushakov flying submarine. Um, it's a German, or not German, it's a Russian um, designer, Ushakov. Um, and he, he the concept of the plane is that the plane flies out, spots an enemy fleet, it flies out just beyond the horizon and dips down under the water, waits for the fleet to go by, releases a torpedo or two, and then waits, you know, and then when the coast is clear, comes back out of the water and flies away to safety or huh. flies away to release another torpedo. So kind of like a sneak attack kind of deal with great, you know, great range and, and that kind of stuff. It was designed to maybe be underwater for about a day. Um, neat idea. Really hard design challenge. I'm still working at that one. Um, it's kind of on hiatus for now, but anyway, so here I am. I built this plane. I designed it from the napkin sketch. I've got it built. It looks just like I want. It's amazing. And it's like a tri-prop. So it's got a center fuse with like a eight inch prop and two nacelle props that are about five inch size, um, a left and a right. And I've got these things set up. This is the first time I've done twins or, or tri-prop kind of deal. Um, and it's new. I've never really worked with it. But you'd think that I would understand that, um, how to set them up. So here I have it. I, uh, it was late, is I think, in November. Um, so it was dark when I got out of work. But I really I finished it, and I wanted to see it made. Now, I just wanted to see it fly off my hands and go. I had one previous attempt that didn't get recorded. And I was hoping to kind of just have it come out of my hands, fly around just for maybe a minute, and land it. Just be perfect have it on my the hands. way they should all fly. The way they all should fly, exactly. First go. Simple. Murphy's <laughs> Law says no. So I have it on my hand, on my right hand, um, because I apparently have no ability to throw with my left hand with any kind of grace or accuracy. So I have it on my right hand, like a pizza, I'd imagine, <clears throat> the plane is about three feet wide by three feet long or so. It's got the three props in the front. And I've got, so I basically have been doing little throttle tests. So I, everything seems to be working. 
Um, nothing's twitchy or anything, so that's good. Everything's set. Control surfaces are going the right thing. So now I'm ready to basically bring it up to about 80% throttle and kind of give it a nudge. And with any luck, I'll be able to get the controls fast enough to fly it around. Well, I bring it up to 80% throttle. Now, keep in mind, this is on my hand next to my head at about eye level. Okay? I put okay. up to 80% throttle, and it starts to spin like a top. Uh-oh. Right next to my head. I mean, literally, <laughs> the, the propellers are whirring past my ears, um, probably three or four inches away. I panic. Uh, all of my danger senses are up high, and I just, I just throw the thing as, as far as I can, which at the minute isn't really far, but it's enough for me to duck and get the heck out of the way. I'm, I'm also right. thinking, like, I've got long hair. I don't want to get that caught in the prop because, holy, that's, that's going to be even worse. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I could barely get enough time to get the throttle done. I just want to get away first. So this thing's spinning like a top of my hand. I kind of huck it away. I dive, bring, bring the throttle back down and just like go, Oh my God. Like that could have been so much worse. I didn't want it to cut my hand. I didn't want it to cut my face, uh, come out my eyes, shoulder. Goodness. I mean, all of that is right there as the things whirring around in a yeah. circle. Uh, the good news is I got it on tape or right? I've got it on video. Uh, it's on YouTube, and we'll put a link in the resources along with a couple of the other uh, things that we're talking about. Um, and I'll tell you what, that was the scariest... I, it's the scariest time I've ever had trying to launch a plane. I mean, I've had a couple pretty, like, iffy situations where it did something I did not expect. Right. Um, but that one by far was just the most dangerous and the scariest. And at that point I said, I'm not going to launch this thing unless I've got a uh, landing gear on it, honestly, uh, which I still have yet to have success getting it into the air. But so what I had was the left nacelle was, uh, the prop was on backwards or spinning the wrong direction. So it was pushing and the right oh, one man. was pulling <laughs> like the proper tractor it should have been doing. So right. it was literally just trying to spin as fast as it could. You'd have gotten a heck of a tailspin out of it or a flat spin out of it. It, yeah, it would have been amazing. Yeah, it would have been awesome. <laughs> uh, Just not right next to your face. I, I didn't want it to happen next to my head, thanks. <laughs> oh, man, I'll tell you, that was my scary side. I mean, it really terrified me um, to the point where I was like, maybe I should put this stuff down for a while. <laughs> oh, but, uh, you know, I couldn't resist uh, continuing at it because the it it's a this is such a fun hobby, and it's so rewarding. Um, now, I know uh, part of what I wanted to talk about is just the, uh, maybe at the tail end of this, or do we want to talk about um, some of our listener write-ins? Um, um, I wanted to talk about what a, a couple extra items you might want to throw in a first aid kit based on what we've just been talking about. Um, go, go ahead and do the first aid kit items, then we'll, then we'll do the... Okay. Uh, it sounds that sounds good. Okay, uh, they're really basic uh, in the sense like you, you want to have your your gauze and your first aid band aids and and things like that. Um, but the extra couple things you want to have, there's like a chest wound patch gauze patch that has a clotting agent kind of built into it, um, and that's for basically when you get a prop strike that goes down to the bone, and the bigger right. the prop and the more powerful the motor, the more likely this is actually going to happen. Uh, so you definitely want that. Um, uh, you want a tourniquet. So that's a strap with one of those kind of latches, almost like at the bottom of your, uh, backpack kind of deal right? where you can just cinch it and just crank on it. And then, um, and that's, you know, if you get a cut in your arm with the same kind of thing, you, you may need the tourniquet. Um, and, and I and, should, uh, we should preface this or postface it with look into the proper use of a tourniquet. Um, a lot of yeah. people assume that it's what like you use it a certain way. Look into the proper use and technique of a tourniquet. I don't want to give any guidance on it um, no, right. for reasons, but look look into it. A lot of times, yeah. a, a lot I'm, of people have a misunderstanding on how to properly use a tourniquet. Right, and I'm not a medical professional either. Um, so again, leave it to them. Like, look at the instructions. Make sure you understand how to use these items before um, you put them in your kit. Um, but the and and I always had the misconception that if you put on a tourniquet, you're basically going to have to amputate whatever, you know, like that was just something, I guess I grew up as a kid thinking. Right. 
And that's not the case. As a matter of fact, I've, I've had some medical professionals tell me like, no, 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 man, if you need a tourniquet, use it. Like, we'll figure it out. But right. if, if you can't make it to the hospital because you're bleeding out, the tourniquet is way better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. <laughs> Duh. So, yeah, have a tourniquet. It's, it's lightweight. It's simple. It's uh, e easy to put in your, in your thing. And your field uh, – and actually – if you haven't, if you fly to flying fields, check out where the first aid kit is and what's in it. So you at least know in case you have an emergency that you, you know, you know what to do or where to go or how to have it. And if they don't have anything, put some in your car, uh, in mm -hmm. your go bag, uh, larger bandages. So normally they have kind of like a little bit of gauze pad, like something, maybe a two inch square, right. get something that's longer or larger because you may need it in a dire circumstance. And then the other thing is get a fire extinguisher that is adequate to put out a lipo fire. So it's basically, I, I believe that's a dry chemical fire or electrical fire. Um, you want something that's just basically going to smother that thing with foam and just keep it, because it, it's going to be on fire, foam or not. Because um, it's a chemical fire, it's a chemical reaction that's happening in the battery itself. And that is powered and fueled by the battery. And there's there's nothing you're going to do to, to actually stop that reaction. But what right. you can do is stop it from spreading to the surrounding materials like grass, uh, any wood that might be nearby, people, planes, et cetera. So <clears throat> have, have a, know where the fire extinguisher is at your field. If you don't have one, make sure you have a little one with you in case there is um, a big issue. Carry have a know where there's a bucket of sand. If you have a lipo that's not quite fully on fire and you want to put it somewhere safe, you have a metal bucket with sand in the bottom and you could just dump it in there and let it burn out and it'll be safe. Okay. So I mean those are just some basics to make sure that you are somewhat safeguarded for heaven forbid, some of the things that we had so many close calls with, if they weren't if they were closer, you might have needed these extra things. So Try to have it, you know, have it on mind and have it in hand, uh, or at least know where it is in case that ever happens. If you know, it's less likely to happen, I think. Mm -hmm. And we're not trying to, you know, be fear mongers in, in this part. We're just, you know, you, you've already probably, you may already have a first aid kit, just a couple extra things. If you don't carry a first aid kit, which I don't always either, um, yeah, it's either. worth carrying them. Yep. Okay. Good advice. Uh, Matt, what do you say we uh, get into the stories that were shared with us? Yeah, I'd love to. That'd be fun. Um, okay, so uh, we've got one that was written in, and then we got some audio files that I'll pull up. Okay. Uh, do you want me to read the one that was put in? Um, you can. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this was written in by Dan Sponholtz. Uh He was at the build party, and kind of just reached out. I know that uh, he's an avid RCer, so uh, and he, he kind of said, he says, it's not much of a horror story, but I did have one bad experience early in the hobby. It was back in 2014 when I was less than a year into the hobby. I just built a new FT Bloody Wonder. Uh, I didn't want to wait for the electronics to ship from Hong Kong or Hobby King, I think, HK it says. So Hobby King, I think which of course at the time took over a month to get shipments from China or the China warehouse at the time. So he bought them uh, from a local hobby store and paid about, you know, three times as much as it would from um, the China outlet there. Uh, but he was so excited to get the thing in the air. And instead of going to the usual flying location, he decided to take it to the local fairgrounds that was close to his house. Uh, he says, I got everything set up, battery charged, checked my controls, and did a pre-flight the of the plane. Everything looked good, and I tossed the plane into the air and started flying. Things were going great. Then I put a couple, I put it a couple of my stakes high and kept it close to me and got it trimmed down, and everything was flying perfectly. Then I decided I could start flying a little further out, and I started to fly a larger circuit and watched as my, my great plane brand new plane with over $150 worth of electronics just continued to fly away and disappear. Oh no. <laughs> I was like, Oh, I've had that. Uh, I had a quadcopter that did that. Uh, he said, I lost all control of it. 
it was a sickening feeling. He goes, I spent hours looking for it, but I never did find out what happened to it. The worst part of that is that it could have ended up flying over people's property or homes. It could have caused damage or worse, injuring somebody. It felt horrible. He goes, I felt horrible. I believe that the issue was signal interference, which I probably would have discovered or discovered had I ever done a range check. Lesson learned the hard way. Uh, and yeah, I mean, similar similar situation with the uh, Spitfire, but it sounded like he had his uh, his fail state set up to uh, keep it her just going. Continue whatever the controls were. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, and that's or oftentimes at least the some default preset. Mm hmm. Exactly. Well, and it just kept going. So and and that's that sickening feeling. You know, I had a quadcopter that it was like the one of the first ones I bought. I, I put it up next to my house. I was like checking out all video footage like this is the best. This is cool. And the wind started to take it and I wasn't able to really control it well. And it kept going. And then I realized I'm like, oh, back, return home should be great. And then but the, by that point, I'd already gone out of range. And it just kept flying. Oh, no. And I, I just had this sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. I, I was like a beaten puppy or something for like the next day and a half. It mm -hmm. was terrible. It was a horrible feeling. So I, I can absolutely feel uh, like I, I, I could feel for, for Dan at that time. And, uh, and he's right. You know, just know what the range is of your equipment and check it. It's uh, with yeah. the with the hobby grade equipment. It's really easy to do. It's usually just a button. Yeah, I've never done a range test on uh on my Turnigy. I really ought to do look up how to do it. Do that sometime. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dan, for sending that in for us. Uh, do we have another one? Uh, we do. Uh, let's see. We'll start with uh, Zediok. Zediok is a member of our Discord server and listens mm -hmm. in. And uh, I know you'd reached out to him and asked if he had a story to share. And this yeah. is what he sent us. Hello. I was asked to give a scary flight story. I'm not sure if this is scary, but it was certainly frustrating, exhilarating, and educational. It's the fourth attempt at a maiden flight for my recently built SE5 biplane. Oh, uh, one of Vincent's planes. Great looking plane. I spent way too many hours uh, detailing it out before I flew it. Three color paint jobs, stencils, it looks great. 3D printed engine parts, the works. First time out though, I mean we're talking fourth attempt so it clearly took me some learning. <laughs> First time out, put it on the runway, start taxiing, hit a small bump, and the landing gear folds. My fault, clearly. Back to the drawing board, a couple days later with a better landing gear. I take off the thing starts to, well, I attempt to take off. The thing starts to veer left. I'm thinking thrust issues. I cut the power. And it goes off the runway into the grass. I actually hear the snap this time. No more landing gear. Oh. Oh. Okay. Week later, I'm thinking, okay, surprised. maybe let's rebalance the plane. I found the left-right balance was off. Fix that. Add a little bit more right thrust to the motor. Rebuild the landing gear. And it's solid this time. I mean, it's heavy. It's great. I think we're ready. Third attempt. Early morning, windless day, beautiful. Taxi it down the runway, come a little bit into what little wind I have, hit it, gets about a foot off the ground and goes left, sharp left roll. And I'm trying to correct, but I panic. I pull out, cut the throttle, it comes back down hard, and I broke the landing gear. It's early though, go home. <laughs> Spend three Dude, hours redesigning, the reprinting the landing gear. This time, I, know, I don't right. care about weight. It's going to work. That's a 3D printer. Oh, I guess he went and printed it mm -hmm. this time. I take off. Same thing happens. Hard pull to the left. And instead of panicking, I punch it. I, it's just, it's going to fly. It does a fairly rapid corkscrew straight up. I mean... It, the wings are still kind of parallel to the ground, but it's doing this kind of like bird in a thermal thing going straight up. Oh, no. I have very little control of this plane. Now I'm worried because I've got a beautiful plane I worked a lot of time on and I it's not coming back. I know it. And oh, that must have felt terrifying. As I'm gaining speed, I'm starting to get a little bit more control and I'm regretting my decision to only go with two ailerons instead of four. Top wing, bottom wing. 
I just went with the bottom wings. I figured it's probably enough. It's not. First lesson, I guess. And <laughs> I'm getting it slightly under control, and I'm doing full right aileron trim, a lot of right rudder trim, and I can get it going. I can control it now. Sort of. It's fighting me. And now I realize I've got to land it. It doesn't like going slow. As I slow down, the air over the control surfaces is getting less and less, and my control is getting also less and less. <laughs> and this plane is now going left. I, I can't get it to turn right. I can get it to go straight, but it won't go to the right. So I'm coming Oof. in, and as I get really close to the end of the runway, I'm trying to at least get it not on the cars or the trees or me. It comes down, and it I, I overcompensate with the right rudder. I, I panic, and I think I stall it. Memory's fuzzy at this point, but it does this weird loop twist. It looked like something a skateboarder might yeah. do, and it came in yeah. and just kind of beautifully lands flat, oh. no damage to the airframe. Although when I go to walk up to oh, get it, gears. the landing gear is shot. So <laughs> this plane is now hanging from my ceiling, oh. mocking me until I am yeah. brave enough to try again. So that was definitely oh one God. of my most exciting flights that one day, maybe, <laughs> if I get up brave enough, I'll see if I can tame it. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope to have more experiences like that. They are fun and a great part of this hobby. Take care. Oh, that was that was awesome. Thank you, Jesse. Thank uh, you, Jesse. Yeah, a lot of people really love the SE5. And I can feel his pain about landing gear there. It, it's never my friend, yet I'm always wanting to hang out with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah his uh while i don't think landing gear was his root problem uh he did not have very oh. good luck with landing gear <laughs> oh man he didn't it sounds like me i've I've had very little luck with landing gear myself too oh my god yeah uh, the maiden flights are always the worst they're just so sketchy mm -hmm. um how about uh i know i asked uh chris mccallum to put something in did he do we have a little something from him yeah, we do. Uh, Chris is also in the Discord server, and I know you and Chris hang out a good bit and build uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, we build basis. a lot. Yep. Uh, all right, so here's his. Hey there, Matt and Joe, guys over at the Aviation RC Noob channel. Thanks for letting me join in and uh, tell you guys a little story, scary story that I might have for you. Uh, it actually just happened pretty recently. It happened today. I was doing a maiden. It's uh, kind of on my Halloween special. Uh, not really a tradition yet. It's the first installment of on my YouTube channel. But uh, yeah, the Halloween Maiden of the FT Goblin. Um, I upscaled it to 110%. I've had this bird before. I uh, took it out uh, last winter kind of idea. It was 130% for a different size motor. Uh, it's a little smaller this time at 110% upscaled from the FT model. I'm um, doing the Maiden today. I was It was pretty going to be pretty predictable as to how it would react. I knew it was going to be a fast plane has a wide speed envelope. Um, first launch is always kind of crazy. I know that uh, happened on my uh, first maiden. Um, I'm kind of, uh, you know, experienced with the wings. So the uh, the wings themselves, I've, I've you know, maidened and crashed a bunch of them. I've gone through them. I got a whole thread dedicated to it on the FT forums. Anyway, all that gathered up uh, kind of made me nervous for today's maiden as opposed to it being any other style of plane, just being that it is a plank wing, that kind of thing. Uh, so having that in the back of your head, you always, uh, you always, you know, have that little squirrel and chewing on that nut in the back of your brain. So, yeah, you uh, doing it in the first hand toss. Yeah. yeah I was a little nervous. Um, I, I tossed it up. It looked pretty good, but I knew, um, right off the bat on, on, on this, this, this next, I needed to pull back pretty hard on it. So I didn't have enough reflex in it. And, uh, so it was a little bit tougher to control. Um, there was no real center point when it came to elevation and pitch. So, uh, yeah, I, I did the first turn into, uh, into coming back towards myself. So I'm pretty much half lap in just getting ready to do the next turn. And, uh, I rolled it yeah. over and just uh, th the way I built it, it has excessive throws in it. So it rolled over pretty hard. I was going pretty fast <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, it dove straight towards the ground and I was doing whatever. I just it, it lost orientation of it and it was starting to roll and pitch down. And I, I just kind of pulled back on the wing and gave it a little bit of left or a little bit of right as I did it. And it kind of pulled out of it just feet from terra firma. So 
Yeah, it was a huge pucker <laughs> moment. Like I said, not even half a lap in. I, 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 I thought I totally lost it at that point. But yeah, I did pull out of it. Um, I ended up doing a landing after that. Uh, fixed with the, uh, with the programming. I fixed the uh, reflex, that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, other than that, mm-hmm. it was a pretty scary moment being on my Halloween special. It was kind of fitting. Um, you guys can check it out. I just got the video <laughs> uploading right now. You can check it out on uh, my channel, Chris McCallum, on YouTube and. Yep. Uh, Thanks for having me uh, tell you guys a story, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Adios. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Thanks, well, th- <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think I, I think I saw that video in Discord where he linked it. Um, yeah. Yeah, after he had uploaded it, so I, I saw where he had uh, gone into that oh, dive man. bomb and just managed to I know, recover it. I looked it. at that and I went, "Oh, that's going in." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he pulls it out literally like skimming skimming the hay mm-hmm. it's like wow uh yeah we'll, uh, we'll post a link to uh to that video in the show notes for sure um, absolutely I, I felt the same kind of pucker as he was doing i was like <laughs> oh no because it's a good looking little plane you know he did a great job of making it look pretty sharp and, and halloween it's a black and orange and all that kind of stuff so he he had it all set up and i was like Oh, that always happens on the maiden. That's the worst. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he like pulls it out at last second. Like, oh my god, he did it! <laughs> you can tell he was just as surprised as we were. Mm-hmm. Oh man, <laughs> awesome! Thanks, Chris, for sharing that. <laughs> uh, those are definitely scary moments for sure. Yeah. Um. All right. So next, uh, we've got a store. One story each from Ron and Tom. Now. A uh, quick introduction on these guys. Ron and Tom host the uh, the RC Plane Lab podcast, and mm-hmm. I just give a little shout out to them. If you guys haven't heard them before or hadn't tuned in, yeah. uh, definitely go over and have a good listen to them. Um, yeah, go listen. They're they're great. Yeah, I always enjoy listening to their episodes. Um, yeah, they come out on Fridays. We come out on Saturday, so you kind of get a nice one two wombo bombo on that one. Um, but. <laughs> Go check them out, but this is uh this is where Ron or what Ron said. And what, what's that, Matt? Uh, I was gonna say uh, the one thing uh, they tend to fly bigger items. Um, their their planes tend to be a lot bigger than ours, so uh, it's it's always interesting listening to them. They always have kind of a different take on like the other end of the hobby. You know, we're flying all these lightweight foam planes, and they're they're flying these like ten foot wingspan, you know, monsters. Well, Ron is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody is. <laughs> All right. Well, let's hear what Ron had to say. All right. Here we go. Hey, Matthew. Hey, Joe. So I hear you're looking for some uh, scary RC airplane stories. Um, so I've got one for you. Several years ago, I came across, uh, really, it was a once-in-a-lifetime deal that I couldn't pass up on a uh, a 40% scale Yak 54. Now, this plane is huge. It's a It's got a 10.5-foot wingspan. And the engine on it is a, a Desert Aircraft 170cc twin, and Oof. it spins a 33-inch prop. Jeez. So if that gives you an idea of what the scale is. Ultralights so, use Like that. I said, I got a really good deal on this airplane, and I knew that I cannot afford to buy another one just because these are so big and so expensive. And, like, I was super scared to fly this thing because I know what's flinging around in the air. So as I was getting a little bit more used to it, I was starting to do some aerobatics and doing some loops and some rolls and stuff. And as I was doing one of the one of the loops... As I was pulling out of it, the uh, the receiver browned out, and I lost all control over it. Oh, no. Luckily, I was up high oh, enough to where the receiver had time to reset, and I was probably about two seconds from crashing that thing into the ground <laughs> and re it and just sending it into a thousand little balsa pieces. Oh, I God. was so scared after that. Luckily, I was able to bring it in and land it, and no harm done. But I tell you what, that was the, the most scary moment I have ever had flying an RC airplane, and man, I don't think I will ever forget that. Um, so make sure your electronics can handle what you're trying to pull through it. That's, that's the, uh, the takeaway I, I learned from that. So, uh, uh, oh, hope this helps and, uh, happy Halloween guys. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder if that's the yak that I hear so much about, uh, that they talk about, but cause, it, cause I've seen the huge. picture of it. It is huge. Yeah. It's, it's uh, a massive airplane. <laughs> They're really good looking planes too. You were saying something about that that size prop is almost ultralight plane size? Yeah, 33 inch props. Um I've seen some ultralights that use two of those. And mm-hmm. and that that's how they're powered. 
uh, basically oh, twin twin 33 and 24 inch to 33 inch props that's enough pull to to pull you through the air as an ultralight Oof. i mean that's um, massive <laughs> yeah that <laughs> wouldn't want to stick your finger in that one um, uh no chicken stick <laughs> all the way <laughs> That's what they call it when um, you start the when you start the prop with a with a stick. If you're not familiar, yeah. they 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 I guess somebody thought, oh, you're being a sissy, and they said it's a chicken stick. I'm like, I will chicken stick all day long, <laughs> not put my <laughs> hand in that. No kidding. Um, oh man. Okay, and uh, Tom Tom sent an audio file as well. Now again, Tom Tom hosts alongside Ron, so let's mm -hmm. hear his. All right. Hey Joe. Hey Matt. Tom here. Hey, Tom. Heard you guys were looking for some uh, scary RC airplane related stories. I have one for you. Uh, so I got started in the hobby back in 1980, had my first airplane. And uh, my neighbor at the time, his name was Mike, um, helped me out uh, and getting me into the hobby. Uh, convinced my parents that it was uh, about the coolest thing you could do. So uh, for Christmas that year, I got my first airplane. And uh, with his help, I built it uh, shortly after Christmas. And uh, nice. so anyway, a couple of years later, um, my neighbor, Mike, here's where my scary story gets started, uh, was working on some, I believe he was uh, assembling some batteries, uh, putting uh, receiver batteries together. Uh, back then, we used to solder our own cells together, uh, NICADs. Cool. And uh, anyway, okay. he had soldered a battery pack together and he had left his iron on and forgot that he had left his iron on and uh, woke up late that night to a, uh, a house that was on fire. So, uh, oh, no. yep, <laughs> the, uh, the house nearly burned, uh, down. It uh, completely gutted the house. And, uh, unfortunately oh, that was the, God. uh, um, the end of having a cool airplane neighbor. So, uh, that's my <laughs> scary that. story. Uh, hope it, uh, it oh, was entertaining and, uh, hope everybody learns a lesson. Don't leave your soldering iron unattended. I, I don't even know how to respond to that except <laughs> holy crap. <laughs> Well, yeah. I uh, I didn't know this was a contest, but I think Tom takes the cake. Yeah, or at least think, uh, Tom's old buddy. Yeah, Tom's buddy Mike takes the cake, um, gutting the house with a with a with an iron fire. I think that's a winner. <laughs> that's yeah. the scariest thing I could think of. Waking it, up to your house on fire. Holy jeez! I mean, if anything will end up getting you out of the hobby, that that's it. Um, oh my god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too Man, close I'm to just, the call. Thanks. Uh, it, it sounds like everything. Uh, like nobody was, uh, nobody was hurt. Yeah. But it sounds man, like everybody got out okay. Yeah. That that sucks. Um, wow. Yeah, and and thinking about it, the number of times I've left uh, a bat, like any number of electronics plugged in, you don't think about it. Mm, I've left right. the hot glue plugged in uh, for yeah. an a, you know Days. an afternoon. <laughs> While I'm doing other things and come back, oh, Jeez. hot glue gun's on. Um, yeah. You're like, what's that man. smell? Oh, hot glue. Oh, crap. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man. Jeez. I wonder if um, I wonder if the soldering iron just overheated or if something bumped it oh, and yeah. it landed in the carpet or against the wood. Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, I know they're definitely hot enough to catch things on fire for sure. Like if it's mm -hmm. a paper product or something like like maybe... If it, if it was in his garage, maybe there's like a, a a breeze that came through or something fell off of a. I mean, either way, it doesn't matter. Like that's just terrifying to wake up with like your house on fire and all you're thinking is get out safe. Yeah. And then afterwards, you realize like, hey, that hobby you like. <laughs> I guess you. Uh, oh man. Don't so, know what to say to that man. <laughs> no, there really isn't much other than. Um, be kind to your lipos. Keep them stored safe like we talked about in our previous episode. Unplug your electronics when you're done. If you need to, put them on a power switch that's connected to your light switch. That way when you leave the room that you're working in, you turn off the lights and everything else turns off with it. Yeah, you know, I'm going to have to pull Jeez. that lipo bag out. I've started like oh my God, please do, dropping Joe, them to please. the storage charge, but maybe I just need yes. to do the right thing and store I mean, them in a bag. If they're in a storage charge, like if they're at storage charge, generally they're safe. The The double safe thing to do is to keep them in a LiPo bag in case 
there is a fault somewhere in there and there ends up being a runaway reaction. Generally speaking, you are more than safe at the thing. The problem is, is if you're like me and you leave them full charge because you think perpetually, I'll fly tomorrow. I'll, yeah. I'll totally grab that and fly that battery tomorrow. And you just end up not for whatever reason. Um, yeah, that's when you really start putting yourself more at risk than you you should really. You should I should be taking all my batteries and just returning them to storage charge. And uh, mm. what's the worst that could happen? You have an ammo box, you you store them in. That's where you just keep your batteries. They're in an ammo box. If they catch fire, then they catch fire, and at least they're not going to catch everything else. Wow. You know, just crazy. I really speechless thinking about that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so thank you, Tom, for the scariest story on our <laughs> podcast. I, I appreciate you sending it in and sharing that with us. And Mike, we're terribly sorry about your hobby, <laughs> your loss of the hobby, and your, uh, you know, that your house was gutted. And uh, we hope everybody, well, uh, everybody was okay in that. And and we're presuming a touch on that. He just, you know, that they may have had to move after that. But um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, guys. You know, everybody who wrote in, Spawns, Zediok, Chris, Ron, Tom, thanks. Um, it was great hearing y'all's stories. And yeah, thank uh, you. if anybody else wants to write in, let us know about what uh, kind of scary things you've had going on, or just let us know about your flight stories or anything, feel free. Write us right. in, head over to Anchor. Um, you know, there's a voicemail button over there you can utilize. Um, it's, a, it's a message button is what they have. They have a little chat bubble with a plus, and it says message. <laughs> so let us know what you got going on. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's like a public service announcement, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just you know, not not trying to be fearful in the hobby or fear no. mongers. Just nope. keeping things in mind. Uh, with with the intent of this podcast is the goal of this is so that if any of us can learn from each other and be better off in the hobby than they would have been without it, then I think we've all done our We've all done our piece. So uh, yeah. I'd love, you know, if you could help us, that'd be great. Um, So Matt, we're coming up towards the end. Do you want to quickly go over what you're going to be working on coming up? Uh, yeah, I could do that. Uh, I'm going to keep working at that paper thing. Um, that, that, uh, trying to see how that kind of comes together. Uh, finish up the flying fleece. If I can get that flying. Mm -hmm. Um, I think by the end of the week, I'll have a flying coronavirus, um, some, <laughs> some sort of nutball version of it or other. <laughs> um, and, uh, as, uh, and I might be dredging up yet another, um, airplane from the grave. So maybe next time we tune in, I'll tell you what I pulled up from the grave. I know Joe's secretly think, thinking, let it be the spruce goose. Let it be the spruce goose. <laughs> and, uh, it, it may it may be. Okay. Well, if it is, then uh, we're gonna have to. I'll have to drive up and give okay. you a hand with that because I remember last time we talked about it, there was some serious uh, electronics issues going on with it. Uh, yeah, a enough where it was worth probably pulling the whole thing, to, the wing, to pieces and rebuilding that piece. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm. I if I dredge it up, it's it's the goal is to get it all working. Um, and if that means getting that 12 channel receiver together for the, uh, the radio link and having every motor on a different channel, then that's just what we got to do. There you go. That's it. And what about you? Uh, I'm going to be working on finishing up the old fogey. I would love to be able to, uh, get that finished up before this weekend so that maybe bat I can. Wing. Bat wing. Bat wing. Uh, I'll do the bat wing another time. Um, oh. let me just, let me get that fuse built and get this, get it up in the plane or get All it right. up in the air. I'll be happy to um, hear that. But then it. once, once the fogey is built, I can, like you said earlier, cut the, uh, cut another wing. And before I glue the under camber, uh, shape of it, cut it into that bat shape. And then I do want to cut another fuselage vertical or horizontal stabilizer. And I'll have to modify the top of the fogey fuselage to then put the simple soar wing on it because I still got the simple soar wing in the garage ready to go. I've, I've got an I've got an idea for you on that that okay. might make some of it inter, the the wing tops interchangeable and we can talk about that after. Interesting. 
Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Uh, working on closing out. Remember that Friday, November 13th, uh, 7 to 11 p.m. Eastern time, um, we're going to have the Hangar RC build night. And, you know, feel free to swing by, uh, hang with us, build with us. Um, if you want, go by the Hangar RC, pick up, uh, download the PDF plans to build from. He's got, uh, they've got the free PDF plans you can download, or if you don't feel like building from the plans and you want to get a kit, uh, you can order the kit, uh, yeah. get the skins to go with it, and remember that we have a discount code for you guys, uh, ARCN-BN1, we'll have it in the show notes below, for 10% off the entire store over there. Uh, go over and um, give Sam some love. He definitely has put together some some fun planes to build, and uh, we we really think uh, that you'll enjoy the build. So come out with us and, and enjoy it. And we'll have uh, the build night. It will be on the Discord server. Uh, we'll have a link coming up uh, shortly before it. Um, so keep a, an eye out on the Facebook, and uh, we'll also have it in the show notes when we get to it. All right. Anything else before we go, Matthew? No, I think that's it. I think uh, I scared myself enough, that's for sure. We're living yeah. <laughs> all these uh, near misses here. No kidding. All right, guys. Well, as always, uh, thanks for listening in. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Keep flying. Keep building. Have a good time. And uh, we will see y'all next time. Happy Halloween. Spooky. Spooky. (laughs) Good night. Good night.